Hey, I'm Destin. Welcome back to No Dem Questions. What's up, Matt? Not too much. Things are good. I'm excited for this conversation. Well, I'm very excited for this conversation. Okay, so a while back when we hired our correspondents, we interviewed Lee, and you were very adamant about having Lee research hockey. I could care less about this, Yes, but you, you it's a thing. You're making it... A, just kind of explain to me why this is important. Well, I love hockey. I played it for a long, long time. I haven't played it for several years now because I don't know. I just don't know anybody who plays hockey anymore. The sport is different than all the other sports I've played. I like all the sports, but all of them overlap in this one big clump over here. And then there's this weird outlier that is hockey. Hockey means something different. It feels different to play it. It's almost like the ground rules of relationships are different while you are playing hockey. And so when we connected with Lee Renna, who we've known for a long time, he's been on the program before, but when we brought Lee on after he had a successful interview for the correspondent program, and he became the champion of honesty, profanity, and hockey, I thought, well, I don't know what an episode on honesty would look like. I think we've already done his episode on profanity, so maybe we should do one on hockey or somebody who lives and breathes this thing 10 times more than I do and knows it 10 times better than I do can come on and try to explain to the third chair and to you, my friend, who have not played hockey at all, I haven't why this thing is different, why this thing matters, what hockey means, even if you don't like hockey and it feels like this completely foreign thing, I feel like there is a slice of truth about the human experience and planet Earth that you can only really get if somebody who understands hockey explains it to you. And Lee is the man to do it. And thus, the hockey episode is born. I love Lee, and he's really good at explaining things that you don't really think about until you talk to Lee about it. And I know it's going to be good. So Lee, the goal today, I, as I understand it, I am the guy that knows literally nothing about hockey other than it's played with a puck, not a ball, and there's some fighting and <laughs> ice skates. I like how you immediately said there's fighting and nothing about scoring or anything like that. that just, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, so when initially, uh, when, after we did the uh, correspondent interview, you guys wanted to have one uh, strictly about you know hockey and how that relates uh, relate hockey to life. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, did some research, and uh, th- basically the outline that I'm going to go with is how I got involved with hockey. And why I love it so much, then dive into the history, kind of talk about some of the sport ancestors of hockey, some historical figures, uh, as well as diving into the dynamic of a hockey team, the positions, the roles. And then after that, uh, after those discussions, we'll kind of talk about how it relates, how I relate it to life. So Dude, I'm so excited. <laughs> this is going to be awesome, a, man. Yeah. It's a magnificent outline. You it, it really I'm is. I'm kind of intimidated. And you're wearing something, Lee. Yeah. Yeah, this is... Uh, Thankfully, unlike last time, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is uh, this is my adult league hockey jersey. Uh, play for the puck and beers. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, number eight on the back, just like so it's on my lightsaber. Opportunities. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Wait, what, wait, what's on the back? A number does eight. Have your name on the back? It does not. Right. We're not that fancy. We didn't. There was like yeah, it, it costed more to add letters. So, <laughs> no, that's the incorrect answer. The correct response was the name on the front matters more than the name on the back. So we didn't. Put that's it on not true. Team. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 there I is an M and there is an M and an E in team, and that's me. So, <laughs> all right. So hockey. Let, yeah. can, can I briefly tell you what I know about hockey? Is would that be helpful or not? Um, it it would, <laughs> and also very interesting. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so my grandfather used to take me to hockey. Uh, forgive me, is it a hockey game or a hockey match? What is it? Game. Hockey game. Um, but actually, both. If you're overseas, it could be a match, but here we call it a hockey game. Okay, cool. Granddaddy used to take me to hockey games, you know, locally here at the Von Braun Civic Center. The UAH Chargers, which is the school I go to, they have a hockey team. And I don't know anything about them other than it's really odd for there to be a hockey team in Alabama. And so I know about that team. I've watched several of the games, and you know the fan base is pretty fun. That's about it. Um, I know there's, you know, hockey kind of blurs the lines between America and Canada, whereas baseball is more of a American thing with a few Canadian teams. Yep. Hockey is kind of the inverse. Is that true? Yeah, it's like a, hockey is a Canadian sport that 
we've also adapted here in the States, but it's worldwide. It's international. It's one of my favorite things about the sport is a lot of times with the sports that we, you know, the big four we like here in the States, are usually, they're state sports. It wasn't until recently that like basketball and baseball started going international and getting popular, but like football, the NFL, that's just here. The NHL, it's, it's all over the world. And watching those international teams play, uh, if you're going to be the best in the world, I think you should have to play the world. Uh, so... Hmm, interesting. And, and Matt, you've taught me in the past, because Matt, you played hockey, right? Yes. And Matt, you taught me that hockey is not played in lines. It's played in curves or arcs. Is that what you said? Well, yeah, that's what I would describe it as. Yeah, it's played in arcs. And that's what's fun and different about it. It's everything else I do. Tennis, with the exception of the spin you put on the ball. So you got to think about arc a little bit there. But tennis, volleyball, baseball, basketball, football, everything else I've thrown a bunch of time at athletically. You move from place to place. You can pivot quickly. Whereas hockey, I feel like everything about the culture and the mindset and how you interact with people, how you interact with the puck, how you approach an objective is all changed because stopping, even though it looks linear, is really a movement of a, a short arc. And an arc is the quickest way to get where you're going because you're riding on the edges, this tiny little edge on this slick surface. And so it just, you, you move differently when when I'm in hockey season and my brain's thinking about hockey, I picture movement differently than when I'm in tennis or baseball mode, even like when you dream or you think about it when you're gaming out what you're going to do. So, yeah, I think that's a, a huge difference. Uh, some of the sets hockey aside, that's really cool. Awesome. All right, Lee, what are we doing? All right, so as far as, you know, Matt said he, you know, grew up because his sister was at the rink uh, or at the, um, or whether it was outside or indoor, um, and that's where he started first playing hockey. For me, uh, I came from a baseball and football family. My, my uncle played a few preseason games for the Detroit Tigers as a pitcher. My dad was a football player. Hockey was not a thing. And so when I was, I believe it was 1990, I was nine, and uh, we moved to New York Street in Lincoln Park, Michigan. We had just moved. Um, it was a new neighborhood, and it was Christmas break, and I could hear kids outside playing. So I ran to the window, and there was four kids out there, and they were playing hockey. And so I sat there and I watched them for a while. They looked like they were having some fun. And finally, one the biggest one, Mike Harris, who ended up being one of my close friends, looks at the window and waves me out. So I got all dressed, ran out, and uh, hands me a hockey stick. And he goes, what hand are you? I have no clue. So I just pick up a hockey stick and naturally was right-handed. That's your hand. I looked on the street. They had taken white stones, garden stones, out of the neighbor's yard, and we had an asphalt road, and they drew a whole rink on the road. And so he goes, here's the thing, though. If you're going to play with us, you're a goalie, and then we'll trade out. And uh, I'll tell you this right now, playing goalie uh, right out the gate, and this my, my introduction to hockey was eye-opening to me because do you know what a, a street hockey ball is, Destin? In my mind, it looks like a racquetball, but it's heavier, and it like if you were to drop it, it wouldn't bounce very much. No, as a matter of fact, they're called non-bounce balls, and that's they're hard plastic, and but they're very light. And when you are in freezing temperatures in Michigan, and kids are ripping shots at you, that is a wealth scenario. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, if you let it go in, there was no like I said, they drew the nets on the ground, so you're running a quarter of a mile to get this ball. So, but, uh, that moment for me was where my love for hockey took off that like, I could tell you what they were wearing. Uh, Mike Harris, Hey, he had a Detroit Red Wing hoodie on and Detroit Red Wing. I know you call them toboggans, but they're it's Nick Cap or Tuke. PJ Frederick. He had a uh, Chicago Blackhawks starter jacket because all the cool kids did. The other two had Red Wing starter jacket. It just, that was so impactful on me. And then from there, it took a, a year or two of convincing my mom to sign me up for ice hockey, which was right down the street for me at the Lincoln Park Community Center. And uh, I remember my first game. I, my dad still at this point really didn't know how much I played and loved hockey. And I finally worked up, uh, you know, courage to ask him to play because it costs a lot of money. And, you know, my parents split at a very young age. I got a, you know, single mom. My dad, uh, he picks me up on the weekends, but we're lower middle class, not a lot of money. And so... We're going to my first game, and <laughs> he has a talk with me. He goes, listen, I'm paying a lot of money for this. If you ride the pine, you're done. You're not playing anymore. I'm like, all right. Well, I'm smiling because not because I know I'm not going to be bad. So my Uncle Tony has a video camera. He's videotaping all this, and I think he still has the tape. 
we skate out into warm-ups, and my dad goes, which one's Lee? And they go, he's number 19. And he's like, who, number 19? And he looked, and I had the C on my chest for captain. And he goes, he's the captain? And my mom goes, yeah. And you could hear on the videotape, he went, ah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Which means he was going to be spending some money for the next few years. But, uh, yeah, and that's... Okay, real quick, though, real quick. If people are thinking captain and they're picturing football or baseball, it means something different. Explain to us why that's such a big deal in hockey. How's it different than other sports? Again, where I grew up, kids who played hockey, that's just what they played. They didn't play other sports. I was the weird one who played other sports. There's something about hockey where if it gets in your blood, that's just what you play. You don't play anything else. And a hockey team after playing all these different sports, is as close-knit of a team as you will ever have. I mean, my first team, I remember at the end of the season when it, that season ended, I, cry, I, thought I, I think I cried for almost a week because it was like I lost a family. Like I, I knew half of those kids were going to go to a different age group. That, that team wasn't going to be the same ever again. So to be named a captain in ice hockey means you've earned the respect of everyone else in the room. A lot of t- there's a lot of teams that'll take votes from the players. It's not just the coach picking a guy. And if the coach does pick you, it's because you've demonstrated that you're a team guy. It doesn't necessarily go to the best, you know, the high scorer or, you know, playmaker, I think. It goes to the guy who puts the team first and is is leading from the front and is isn't selfish and can earn the room of the boys in the locker room. So, yeah. Big deal. And you have two assistants under you. So you were a captain on your very first hockey team? Yep. Why? Yeah. Um, so when I first started playing, I could ice skate really well, but I couldn't stop. And there was a few other very ground floor abilities that I didn't have. But I loved the sport so much. I did whatever it took to play. I didn't care how hard I hit the wall when I couldn't stop. I didn't care. My first coach said at the end of the season that – you know, he's never had a player that he could tell him to run through a wall and he would ask how many. It's just I love the sport that much. I would do whatever it took to play. And that's what earned me. And it was a su- total surprise, too. Before that that game, when my dad saw that I had the C on my chest, I didn't know about it until I was in the locker room before, you know, hitting the ice. Uh, they announced me as the captain right before. And, you know, I wore the number 19 like Steve Eisman. They named me the captain like Steve Eisman. That was my hero for the Joe Detroit Sack. Red Wings. Well, well, let's calm down. We're not there yet. You're going I very. said 19. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, 19 belong. You know who it belongs to. Joe's That's Joe's good. a close second. <laughs> That's fun. What, what's happening? Tell me what's happening. I don't um, understand. Do you remember our, uh, the first podcast I came on and uh, Matt and I were no going one back can and forget the first podcast. <laughs> 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 and we were going back about the Detroit Colorado uh, rivalry. Okay. So the captain and number 19 for the Detroit Red Wings is Steve Eisman, my hero growing up. Okay. And the captain and uh, number 19 and stud for <coughs> Colorado Avalanche, uh, Matt's team, uh, was Joe Sackick. And Joe Sackick is a Hall of Famer, Stanley Cup champion, all this stuff. But, you know, in a lot of people's minds, which everyone, he's a, he's a, he's a second to Steve Eisman. Also nicknamed the yes. captain. That's nice. his nickname. Okay, so I'm not I'm not in the culture enough to know if we're joking or not joking right now. It's both. Oh no, okay. we hate each other. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But, uh, cool. Steve but Eiserman, we... Steve, Steve Eiserman is the seventh highest scoring hockey player of all time, goals plus assists. Mm-hmm. Joe Sakic is less than a hundred points behind him in ninth. Oh wow! They're both gentlemanly, outstanding, yeah. high reputation, class players, face of a franchise yeah. kind of guys. So Lee, when when I was a a young boy, Cal Ripken Jr. was my baseball player. Yeah, uh, was Steve Eiserman I- Eisman? Yeah, Eiserman. Eiserman. So was Steve yeah. Eiserman your Cal Ripken Jr.? Yeah, and not only that, but he was very Cal Ripken. So, so was Joe Sackick in the fact that when you think of a captain and a leader and uh, how they approached the game and the respect that they had for their team and the teams they were playing, their the personalities are very much alike. That's a great uh, you know connection. But my love for the game started early on, and uh, the things that because people ask me all the time, they're like, you know, you were you're borderline obsessed. You know, whenever I'm having problems or I'm stressed out, I'll look up stats or I'll look, I'll watch old games or I, like I, I mean, there isn't a day that goes by where I'm not doing something hockey related. Really? Oh, oh, so this is I did not know this about you, Lee. Yeah. So have you have you kind of like kind of 
bordered off this part of your personality to me? Because we've been buds for a while. So like, so I bordered it off from a lot of people. My wife, my wife's only seen me play twi- uh, twice. Um, Why? I just, I've always claimed it as mine, and I think that starts from an early age. I grew up in a pretty rough household. There was some abuse there, and so when when I went to the rink, it was my escape. I was no longer the prey, you know. Uh, hockey was my a getaway. I it was my everything. That's why you know that team, that first team I started playing with, that was like my family. My my coach Brian Micus, I still talk to him to this day. He was like a father figure to me, and when that year ended, that broke my broke my heart. So I've always claimed the sport is mine, and that's like like you're saying, like I've shielded it away. I've I've always kept it close. Now people know I love hockey and I'm I'm obsessed with it, but I don't share it a lot. So this is special. What we're doing right now is kind of a, a peek in. Uh, yeah, I would need you to mark this on your calendar. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I'm uh, in. But, All right, but yeah, the, uh, you know, like I said before, there's there's a there's a strange passion that comes with this game. It's very emotional driven. It gets in your blood, and when you become a fan, I don't know. It's hard to describe, and the skill you know that it takes to play the game is, in my opinion, uh, like no other sport. Um, Brendan Shanahan, and I hope I don't butcher this uh, quote. So he was in an interview, and the interviewer said, you know, is hockey hard? And he said, is hockey hard? I don't know. You tell me. We have to have the strength and power of a football player, the stamina of a marathon runner, and the concentration of a brain surgeon. But we need to put all that together while moving at high speeds on cold, slippery surfaces while five other guys use clubs to try to kill us. Oh, and did I mention that whole time we're standing on blades eighth of an inch thick? Is hockey hard? I don't know. You tell me. Uh, so there's a level of skill and talent that isn't with any other sport that I've played that makes it more challenging. And not only that, but growing up with ADHD, I know you guys love baseball. My brain can't do it. It's a chess game. It's slow. It's seeing where the pieces go. Hockey is creative and fluid and changes on the go. Um, it's in nonstop entertainment. It's fast paced. It's something that keeps up with my brain and uh just absolutely fell in love with it and uh oh and again like i said the international piece the fact that it is a worldwide sport that yes i know canada and the u.s are you know big countries but i mean russia for the longest time were just dominant i think they went so ridiculous i think it was like 13 gold medals straight going into the 1980 miracle on ice game do you know about that dustin Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. The Russian international team has just always had a way to pump out talent based on the system they use. The Hall of Famers is uh, just a ridiculous list. Uh, You've got the Finns. You have the Swedish. You have. I mean, there's so many countries. Germany's now coming up. Germany's actually got a really good uh, development program, and you're seeing a lot of uh, German players hit the NHL. As a matter of fact, the MVP last year and point leader. Dreisaitl, he uh, he's a uh, German kid and an absolute stud. I would have guessed Mexican. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that 1980 Miracle on Ice game, if you watch that game and your emotions aren't hit, that was such a special moment for hockey and the U.S. It's in 1980, you got the Cold War, you got U.S. versus Russia or Soviet Union. It was the real life Rocky versus Drago, David and Goliath. The U.S. was filled with amateur college kids from Boston University and Minnesota. Uh, I think one was from North Dakota and one was from Wisconsin. But they were just college kids just wanting to play more. And you have this Russian team, this Soviet Union Red Army team, that are just – they're literally beating NHL teams. That's how – they would come over here and beat our professional NHL teams. That's how good they were. And – you watch that game and how hard those kids fought and you got Al Michaels commentating the whole thing and you know first quarter or first period it's 2 to 2 and then they score one in the second period and go up 3 to 2 and then in the third period they come in the US scores one early and then with 10 minutes left you got the famous Michael Ruzioni goal he comes puck bounces off the left side of the boards and he rips it left side past the you know Russian goalie and the whole rink goes nuts. The whole team storms the ice. They celebrate that goal. And then you start getting towards the end of the game and they start counting it down 10, nine, eight, because nobody expected these kids to beat 
this Russian team, and like two or three seconds left, you hear the the famous you know scream from you know Al Michaels, you know, do you believe in miracles? And uh, just this beautiful moment in sports and history, and with everything that was going on in the time, it was just, I mean, awesome, dude. I just. I just got chills hearing you talk about that. <laughs> I just, it, you know, I, and, you know, I, you know, you're, you're turning me a little bit. I, I didn't, I didn't think I, I was going to be the naysayer in this, but I yeah. literally just got chills hearing you talk about that because I can tell this isn't. Nor- I can see it in your eyes. This is not. This is not a thing. This is no- This is serious. Yeah, that's amazing. Like I will literally watch that game and choke up. Like I can just watch highlights of that last 15, 30 seconds. And choke up like the hair on my arms are standing up because nobody expected these. Literally, it was boys versus men, and they went out there and they did the impossible. And yeah, I can't. That famous picture of them all grouped together, hugging, holding each other again, bringing in that family team aspect. It's awesome. So like baseball, I got the Sandlot right. I got these things that matters. We can't talk about a hockey episode without me at least asking if The Mighty Ducks is a respected movie or if it's not. So <clears throat> for me, at that time, it, it, it was. I Like me and my friends loved watching it. It's a horrible movie from beginning to end. It's a horrible movie. It is a horrible movie, but there's hockey in it, so we fell. And it's funny that you brought up The Sandlot. Remember how I said, you know, when I learned hockey on New York Street and Lincoln Park, and that's a – at the end of our block – there was this pavement, this asphalt that led to a field where radio towers were. And it, this pavement wasn't very big, but it was a perfect surface to play street hockey. That's where me and all those kids that I was talking about grew up playing with one another. It, and it was very sandlock. And that is where we spent our time. Rollerblades? Our, yeah. Our version of Babe Ruth was Gordy Howe, uh, this mystical being, this legendary figure in hockey. And we literally grew up playing together and we got so good that we actually one year we joined a uh, roller hockey league and they broke us up after the first two games they awesome wouldn't, they wouldn't let us play it again oh, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's awesome but these were all the same guys that like is, no one would admit it because everyone's sitting there going because mm, we all went to go see the mighty duck movie together they were like we're all going this is a really bad movie but there's hockey in it you love it anything there wasn't a lot of Hot movies that had anything to do with hockey at the time, so it was a big deal for us. So, so. what what is the hockey movie? If I want to understand hockey and <laughs> watch something respectful, what, what hockey movie do I need to watch? So if if you uh, uh, forewarning about this movie, uh, it's very vulgar and crude, and if you don't have the appetite for that type of stuff, you might not watch. But the greatest hockey movie of all time is Slapshot. Okay, um, uh, you got uh, Paul Newman, who's the lead actor in it, and it's funny. It's a great take on the game at that time in the 70s where violence uh, was a big thing. Uh, the Boston Bruins were a big physical team at that time, and the Philadelphia Flyers were the Broad Street Bullies. Uh, and they were known for their enforcers and their fighting, so they're the ones that created this idea of I went to a boxing match and a hockey game broke out. Matt, do you sign off on that? I know you like movies. I would say Miracle. I think Miracle's wonderful for I mean, it crosses so many boundaries in terms of audience. I just that's my favorite hockey movie. We just, that just shows the personalities here. I just went from one of the crudest movies ever made to Matt. You know, he's got this Disney soft. <laughs> it touches political and it just so many cultures. And, and I'm over here and it's like I like it when he shakes the guy. That's right. <laughs> Hey, this episode of No Dumb Questions is not brought to you by Audible, but there's one coming up in a couple days that is going to be, and we have a book club episode coming up, so we thought we should tell you. Am I doing this right? Kind of. I think, well, I'd like to do it this way. I would like to say a sincere thank you to the patrons, because this episode is not sponsored, but it is supported by the patrons. So thank you to everyone who is what we call a wing to SAR, someone who supports the podcast by going to patreon.com slash no dumb questions and you sponsor us so to speak there on patreon i'm grateful for that and i know you are as well matt yes i am it keeps the thing going it does straight up it keeps us on the mics it just puts us in a position where it makes it easy and automatic for us to make sure that we are in rhythm on this and we like that and it seems like the wing to sars like that and so thank you yeah and this time it's going to support a correspondent so that's great yes it is All right, you are correct. We have a book that we're going to talk about in an upcoming episode, and that is Getting to Yes 
Have you actually listened to it yet? I'm, I'm guessing you haven't. I've listened to about half of it, but then I picked up Ready Player Two, and I've been chipping away at that. But now that we've got the discussion episode coming up, I'm going to finish it out. I'm enjoying it. Awesome. Yeah, and the cool thing about having the Wing to SARS having our back and supporting the program is that it doesn't make whether or not we record one of these contingent on whether or not we have the right kind of sponsorship lined up. It makes it contingent on are there Wing to SARS, and there are. So here's an episode. That's awesome. So the book we're going to review here soon is Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Urie. Uri, I never know how to say people's last names. It's a book about negotiation, and we're going to talk about it in an upcoming episode. And it would be great if you listen to that before we actually do the episode. You know, you can just listen to the episode without that. We're going to summarize the book. But it's a pretty short one. It's pretty easy. Four hours. Yeah, and it's useful. I don't want to do the conversation with you now because it's not how we do things. But I have already made use of things that I learned. And I have already trying to be vague here, thought about things about myself or recognized things about myself that I did not recognize before reading the book. It's been good for me. Yeah. And it's helped me negotiate nuclear arms treaties and stuff. So that's great. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> they do talk about that. I was going to say it, it helped me get that lady at Arby's to replace the sandwich she made me that didn't have the cheddar cheese on it. So I did get that sandwich, and I'd like to say it's because of the book. <laughs> That's awesome. So there you go. Getting to Yes, um, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In. We're going to talk about that book coming up, and it'd be great if you listen along with us. And thank you to the patrons. Yep, strongly agree. Thank you so much to everybody who supports the program, and I am excited about this conversation we have coming up, so we will hope you'll check out the book and give it a listen. So what, what team do I need to go for? Lee, like what? I mean, um, you're gonna say Red Wings, I'm, right? I'm no, I'm a big fan of you. Don't pick your team; you're born into them. Uh, so I love my Detroit sports. Mm -hmm. um, I know in your area for like football, you know, you got the Broncos and the, the Rockies and the Avalanche, like for for that area. So for you, uh, being as close as you are um, to Nashville, that's your closest team. Uh, I think you've been born into that team I need you need the to predators. put on the, the Preds um they, they they usually got a pretty good squad especially of late and they got one of the best fan bases yeah. Oh, yeah. I've ever experienced those fans up there are awesome will you take me to a Predators game 100% absolutely that'd be freaking awesome can I dude come yeah absolutely we can we you know what just to ensure a win right now we can make sure they play the Red Wings because <laughs> we suck right now it's bad <laughs> historically bad are the Predators good uh usually yeah for the past Mm, I would say probably five, five, six seasons. They've been yeah, pretty, pretty good. A couple of those times, they easily could have gone to the Stanley Cup championship. Matt, who's your team? Avalanche. Oh, it's Colorado Avalanche. Okay. Yeah, from year one of the franchise, they were the Quebec Nordiques. So that's yep. That that's the thing is in uh, 1979, the NHL absorbed the WHL, which was like another like like the CFL for the NFL type of thing, and. Uh, they had some financial problems, so the NHL basically just absorbed them. And two cool facts that came from that, one for you, Matt, being that one of the teams that were absorbed were the Quebec Nordiques that would later move from Quebec to Colorado. You guys were originally a WHL team, yeah. and so you're, all, a lot of your history is enshrined with Quebec Nordique history. But the other thing about that is when the WHL was absorbed – that gave way for this statistic that is that's pretty funny. Wayne Gretzky's the only player in the NHL history to never be drafted. So when he played for the WHL, huh. yeah, he he was with the Indianapolis Racers, and then Edmonton gave him a contract, but they didn't do your typical player team contract. He they knew he was so good, they gave him what was called a personal services contract, which basically made him like Edmonton Oiler property. So he signed up for a 21-year life of your hockey career contract with the with Edmonton Oilers. So when the NHL absorbed them, one of the teams was the Edmonton Oilers, and he didn't have to enter the expansion draft. He was just a part of the team's property and came with it. So the greatest hockey player in team history was also hockey team property, so didn't have to be drafted. That's amazing. How about that? There you go. Colorado had the Colorado Hockey Rockies. Mm -hmm. I think they were AHL. Yeah. And so before the Colorado Rockies baseball team, there was the Colorado Hockey Rockies. No. And that was the nickname locally, and especially in the early years of the baseball Colorado Rockies. Wait. If you were talking Colorado Rockies hockey, you would say the Hockey Rockies. Wait, 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 wait. AHL's American Hockey League. 
Mm -hmm. So the NHL is the National Hockey League? Yeah, but the AHL is uh, minor league. Yeah, got it. But what's the what's the nation in National Hockey League? At that time, it actually started off as the National Hockey Federation, which consisted of American teams, and then eventually turned into the NHL. I'm sorry. I forgot the date on that. But when they absorbed those, you had other teams being absorbed when they transferred into the NHL. They brought in Canadian teams. And when they did that and got the, it became the NHL, they absorbed uh, Canadian teams. So that's when you had the original six. Matt, can you name the original six? No. Uh, Boston. Um, okay, the, the original six include the Canadian teams, right? Yep. Okay, so uh, Boston, Montreal, Toronto, Detroit. Are all six still in existence? Yep. So, I don't know. I would just be guessing old teams. Uh, Philadelphia? Nope. So you got what, what are they? Detroit, Chicago, Boston, New York, Montreal, and Toronto. Chicago and New York. Those would have been safe guesses. So the National Hockey League, yep. even though it's America and Canada, yeah. just the name just doesn't make sense. But anyway, cool. Well, yeah. The Canadians aren't a big fan that the market, um, a lot of the teams are in – the U.S. It's a Canadian sport. It's the biggest and best league in the world, and it's predominantly American teams. Yeah, so it's it's a thing. It's a thing. You're not the only one battling this. The Colorado Rockies were an NHL team from 76 to 82. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right, because their alternate jerseys use the original logo. Which are cool looking. Yep. I got you. So the Stanley Cup, that's the trophy that people get. I yeah. actually saw it one time yeah. in Los Angeles. There was a hockey player just parading it around. Yep. And my understanding is that if you win the Stanley Cup, you as a player get to do something with it for a whole day. Is that true? You do. Some people, you know, take it back to their hometown and party with their friends and family. Some people go to Vegas with it. Some people, you know, whatever it is, you get, you have it for a day and it's yours. That's awesome. Yep. All right, Lee. So I've actually done a couple of videos on the physics of hockey. Mm -hmm. and, and the two things that I learned are when you stop, um, the bottom of a hockey skate has a hollow ground curve to it. Yeah, it's called yeah, double-edged blade. Double-edged blade? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's my understanding that the deeper that hollow, is, is the term hollow? Yeah, you can, arched hollow, however you want, yeah. The deeper that hollow is, the grippier the, the skates are. Mm -hmm. And so you get more maneuverability if you have a deeper curve on it but you go faster if it's flat is that true um i wouldn't say you go faster if it's flat you'll see goalies will want sharper edges because they have to slide side to side and they want to shave the ice so you'll see they'll have much sharper edges you really have to be a very talented skater to notice because when they're changing the that blade it's very little but yeah um flatter you're catching a little bit more grip, whereas if it's the sharper those edges are, you're getting you're shaving ice more. So, so let me let me make sure I understand. So like if I if I could imagine like a two by four sticking down onto the ice, mm -hmm. so a flat two by four that's squared yeah. off at the bottom, that would not be what you call a sharp edge. No. So if I were to take the bottom of it and I were to make a concavity, yep, like it it would be like two vampire teeth coming down, yep. and there's this like arc going up into the 2 by 4 yeah. that would be a sharp edge. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, because you're digging in. Okay, cool. You're, you're, you're eating ice. And so I filmed this guy stopping. What, mm -hmm. do you, what do you call it when you're skating really fast and then you kind of turn your, your skate sideways and you spray ice? What's yeah, called? literally. It's called you stopping or hockey stop or spray. It's, it's really called the spray? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so. Every young boy who grew up playing, that's that's how your po hockey picture's taken. They really? make, they make, <laughs> they'll set up the camera low and then have you skate up and do a hockey stop and spray the camera, and you look very NHL. <laughs> I used to sign Tough all my cameras, cards. depending on the level at which you're snapping those photos. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So what I learned about that is I asked the Huntsville Havoc when they – are they still here? They are. Okay. Yep. I had a high-speed camera out on the ice, and I said, hey, man, and I drew a little spot on the ice. It was like a quarter inch. I was like, can you stop right here? He's like, sure, bro, one sec. And he just loops around, and he comes and goes, whoosh. And not only did he stop, he was going very, very fast, but mm -hmm. not only did he stop, he stopped within like an eighth of an inch of where I asked him to. Yeah. And so what that taught me is the the quote that you gave earlier, who was the quote by? Uh, Brendan Shanahan. So the Shanahan quote earlier, where you're talking about the physics of what he's doing, yep. this spray 
is very complicated because you're shaving the top layer of ice off, mm -hmm. and by doing that, you're decelerating your body. So the amount of spray that you're like you're actually putting power into the ice, like that's a huge differential yeah. equation. Yep. How long does it take to learn how to do that? Because I can't do it. Yeah, you can. I equate it to it's the same problem gymnasts have uh, when they're trying to do their first back handspring or like their first backflip. It's all about letting go of the fear. If you can accept the fact that you're going to crack your butt off the ice no matter what, it's all about rotating your body in a shift of weight. And a lot of time, what people are afraid of is it just doesn't feel you're on ice, you're going straight. And now I got to shift my hips and transfer all my weight into my front right leg. And it's not natural. It doesn't feel right. It eventually gets there. But initially, it's all letting go of that fear of letting your body go and doing this what feels unnatural. But I feel like I'm going to I've tried a couple of times. And I feel like I'm going to flip over my feet. Matt, is he is what he's saying true? You, you can do it, right? Yeah. Uh, an easier way to get a sense of how to do it is with a much broader blade or an edge. It's easier to learn how to stop on a snowboard. So you're running downhill, but you got that big board, and it just takes a little bit of commitment. And maybe it's because of the slope, but I feel that like people figure this trick out faster with the slope because you can almost grab the the slope uphill from you as you dig in. You're like, oh, I'm not so scared. But it's the same exact principle. It's just that, like Lee is saying, you have to completely sell out to it. And so you watch kids learning it as they're getting started, and it's the same mistake every time. They're just too tentative, and so instead of stopping, they just go right very vigorously and out of control, and now they're panicked, and they find the nearest wall and slam into it. It's, it's the selling out process that gets it done. When you're learning the fundamentals of hockey as a kid, um, the first thing they do is they lay you on the ice, and they teach you how to get up because you're going to be spending a lot of time down there. That's amazing. Okay, so so that's the skates. Got that. Yeah. And I and I realize there's so much more there that we'll just Oh yeah. We'll just leave. So let's move to the stick and then I'll get out of the way. Well, before we get to the stick, hold that question. But all the way back to the Shanahan quote that you brought up again, mm -hmm. Justin. The idea that this is just the hardest sport to play. Anecdotally, I agree. I'm not good at any of the sports, but I play all the sports. The skill set just doesn't transfer. It's a completely different thing. And as evidence, I would submit the Bo Knows How to Do Everything commercials <laughs> of the late 80s. You remember those? Yeah, I do. And I promise you that when they had Bo No Basketball, he just went to a basketball court and like shot baskets because everybody knows how to. I mean, it's intuitive. Yeah. You can figure out how to look competent on a basketball court rather quickly. Mm -hmm. But when they had him do the Bo Knows Hockey thing, he was in socks and he was supervised by two people on either calf to make yeah. sure he wouldn't hurt. No, he does not know hockey. No, Absolutely he doesn't. Not. You watch a professional athlete, a professional baseball player, jump in and throw the football around or shoot baskets or hit a golf ball or tennis ball or whatever. They're fine. It all translates. You watch a professional hockey player go and take batting practice. I'll put a bat on the ball. They're fine. They can throw a ball. It all translates. You ask any of those other athletes to step onto a hockey rink and they look like complete clowns. They could not contribute a thing. LeBron James could play tight end at at least a college level, maybe in the NFL, he would be humiliated, shamed, tarred and feathered and run off the rink if he tried to play NHL hockey. I would, Tell me I'm wrong, I would, I, would, I would treat him with respect and I would show him the door. I would, I would not, I would not <laughs> take it that far. <laughs> I love people. Yeah, I, I feel that. I feel that. My son is starting to try to play hockey he played for one something i forget we did i don't know learn to play yeah i don't know yeah that's that what it's called mm -hmm. yeah so he went out on the ice and he hit, hit it around a little bit he loved it so that's the, i understand the skates I, yeah. I i understand that that's difficult but one thing that's interesting to me is the stick yeah going back to another thing i did with a high-speed camera i asked a, a uah player to do a slap shot where'd you get that idea from did you give it to me i did did you really i came oh. over here after you were tutoring me in uh, Trig, and uh, I had a stick in the back of my truck, and I said, you should do a video on the torque of a slap shot. And I showed, because you were like, don't you just hit the puck? And I'm like, no, I mean, you do hit the puck, but a slap shot where the power, a lot of it generates from is the torque of the stick that catches that inch to inch and a half of ice before the puck. So that was like a little moment that you let me into your hockey world. There you go. And then you let me run off and act like I knew what I was talking about. But it was also a moment that you let me into your world because I didn't. I knew you did YouTube videos, but I didn't know at what level. 
And man, this is a true story. Uh, he goes, man, I, I want to get this slap shot, but I, I want someone who does it really hard. And I said, well, you know, the Nashville Predators, and at the time they had Shea Weber, I said, they, he's got the second hardest slap shot ever recorded by the NHL. And I go, I go Zidane Ochara is 108.9, I think. And then Shea Weber's 108.4. And he's like, really? And I said, yeah. <laughs> he calls the Predators and was like, you know, this is my, I'm Justin Sandlin. I got this YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. He could have gotten Shea Weber, who's going to be a Hall of Famer, has the second heart. <laughs> <laughs> and dude, my mind was blown. But like, the thing was, is that year... Um, they were in the Olympics, and he was playing for Canada, so he wasn't there. So we couldn't get him. Wow. I didn't understand any of this at the time. And in fact, I, be honestly, I forgot all about this. But did, were we out in the, the driveway here? And we, is yeah. that where you showed? Did you have a hockey yeah, stick? I did. It's vaguely yeah. coming back. Yeah. Okay. So this is what I learned from your uh, charter or the thing you had me do. Mm -hmm. I learned that you slap the ice, and you probably told me this directly, you slap the ice before you hit the puck, mm -hmm. and you bend the stick, and then you yeah. release that strain energy into the puck. Right. So questions I have about that, mm -hmm. do you bend it and then move it forward to where it's touching the puck and then release the strain energy, or do you bend it and let it start releasing before it hits the puck? So if it was able to be broke down at that level, I think everyone would be able to do it. It's it's a when you're coming in to take a, sh a slap shot on a puck, whether you're moving or it stands still. Yes, your focus is on that puck, but you're looking to catch just a little bit behind it. it it's so it's going to be a follow through motion. It's not like I'm going to come in. I'm going to catch this exact spot right before the puck. I'm going to get that bend I want, and then I'm just going to let it rip. It's a follow through. It's more of a, I'm going to come in, I'm aiming for this spot. I may hit a little bit behind, a little bit of, uh, you know, ahead. I'm going to create that torque and there's just going to be this, this flex in the stick. And as it follows through that whipping motion, along with the power that's already being generated by your natural swing is what creates a hard shot. So it's not a collision like a baseball uh, bat or mat, like you do tennis and, and you're, no. you put everything that's going to be into the into the ball at the moment of impact, you can actually right. feather it as it's leaving you. Is that yeah. true? You can, that's the, well, the thing is, is like you have snapshots, you have wrist slap shots, you have slap shots. You can do much more with a puck because it's not coming at you. It's either standstill or moving with you. So you have a snapshot, which is more of you're taking that torque generated by the ice and you're putting pressure on the middle of the stick and you're following through just a quick little snap of the wrist that's a snapshot. A wrist shot is when you cradle the puck with the blade of the stick and you're using more of a full body motion to shoot the puck. And a slap shot is when you grab it, cock back, and uh, you know, hammer it home. So another fun engineering uh, fact for you that I didn't know, but in this research it came up, your University of Alabama actually did a test. They wanted to see how much pressure uh, a puck can take. And an official puck is six ounces of vulcanized rubber, and they put it under in a hydraulic press, and it took 80,000 pounds to break it. Uh, so on Smarter Every Day 2, yeah. there's a video of that test. Oh, you did that? Well, it was a buddy of mine, uh, a buddy of mine down the road. He, he has since passed, but uh, yeah, his name was Jeff, and uh, he was moving in one day, and I just said, hey, how's it going? I'm your neighbor, and we started talking, and uh, sure enough, he took me down to the lab, and he was squishing a puck one day. And, uh, well, yeah. I'm glad I could let you know about that. That's awesome. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, uh, I'm, that, that's literally all of my questions that I had yeah. planned. So, so where are we going from here? I know we're burning up some time here. So when I said I had some history, I've got some history. So I'm going to fly through some of the history stuff. Uh, I'm going to start with basically the ancestor sports of hockey is how we have got here. All throughout history, you can go back and find evidence for ball and stick sports. Um, ancient Greece, Rome, Aztec Empire, they all had sports that dealt with humans playing a game where they ha held a stick in their hand and there was a ball on the ground and the goal was to shoot the ball into an, uh, another end. Um, the Athens National Museum of History has a piece of art that was carved out of the Mestoclean wall. The history guy, hit me. What's it called? The Mestoclean wall. In Athens, anyway, Themistoclean, yeah, like named after Themistocles, yeah, 
Is that correct? Am I yeah, saying okay. that right? All right. Yeah. So in that I wall, think you are, yeah. uh, there was actually a piece of art where there were individuals literally looking like they're taking a face off in hockey. They had hooked sticks, almost like the end of a umbrella or a candy cane, and there was a ball in the middle. It looks like they were having a face off. They were naked, but in my opinion, that's how the game oh, should be played. <laughs> I mean, I re- that really gives you a lot for you know trash talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess, is it cold again, Tom? You know, like, but, uh, but yeah, uh, going all the way back, the, uh, uh, the Chinese and even Mongolia played a sport. I'm going to butcher these. I had these here. Uh, I believe it's called, it means stick from a curved root, and it's called uh, biku. And basically, it was uh, field hockey like with two periods for about 15 minutes, and the ball was made of wood but looked like a baseball. I had no idea. Yeah. Ireland, it's still played today. It's called hurling. It's like field hockey. That I've heard of. Oh, yeah. yeah, That one's crazy. Yeah. And that's like 15 players to a side. Um, The objective is to either hit it over the pole or in the goal for multiple points. That was actually in the Olympics in 1904. But they still play that today. Um, Another close one is Shinty. It's a version of that. Nothing. Uh, That's out of Scotland. It's like the brother to hurling. And a cool fact about that is, do you, do you remember when I was telling you when I first started researching this stuff about hockey sticks and where they would, well, the sticks used for shinty, at that time, boys would, to get the wood they wanted, they would go to a site of mountains and steep, on, uh, and steep slopes and look for small trees that were growing out but up, and they would cut those down, and the, the stick was already in the shape that they wanted. So they would cut that tree down, trim it, let it dry out, and then they already had a stick naturally made. There, there wasn't like they had to whittle anything. So the root would go into the side of the hill, yep. and it would it would kind of take a forty five degree bend there. Yep, and that's uh, the mm. the mm. And that was traced back to Shinty players. Huh. Um, the Isle of Man, I, I'm going to butcher this one too. I think it's called Kamag. All right. We're going to go with that. <laughs> um, that was a huge sport there, just like hurling and shinty. It's very like those sports, but kind of dwindled away in the early 1900s because of the introduction of soccer or football, as they call it over there. Some of these sports that I just mentioned were actually also played on ice. They did it in fields and on ice. One that was popular, it was called golf, but it, it, was, it was golf on ice. It was made by, it was by the Dutch. They were the first ones to put skates on, and yeah. So, so so hockey got its origins in the Netherlands? Is that what you're saying? Uh, hockey got its origins, if you want to trace it all the way back, to ancient Egypt. Like that literally all Just these... like marshmallows. Thank you. I remember that. <laughs> don't think I don't listen. <laughs> um, but today, if for modern hockey, the two big ones outside of hockey that are hockey-like are, of course, field hockey, which I'm assuming you both know what that is. Uh, I've seen that it exists. No, I don't. So really. it's a lot. It's like hurling. You got ten players per side with a goaltender, uh, making eleven. Uh, two periods of thirty-five minutes for uh, in a half time. That's five minutes. The only thing is with all these sports that I mentioned that are like hockey. There's one big thing missing. Don't get me wrong; they get rough, but body checking and fight like all that stuff's not really allowed or permitted. So. Why does it exist in hockey and not in other sports oh, like it? we're going to get there. Don't, I have a whole section on that. <laughs> uh, the closest thing to ice hockey you're going to find is called bandy. And it looks like field hockey sticks, but their rink is huge because there's not a lot of defensive physical play. It's just more wide open, flying around, buzzing around, trying to score. And here's a fun fact I did not know about. Do you guys know the top three sports in the world based off number of fans? I'd say football. Like like soccer, mm-hmm. then I would say football, like American football, and then probably something they I play. Not. No cricket, cricket's got to be up there. Okay, and one number three, uh, or those were your I would have gone tennis. Tennis is number four. Oh. Yeah, I would go soccer, cricket, tennis, hockey. It's soccer number one, football for those listening. Cricket's number two, and hockey is number three. Really, but that is a cheat stat because. In Africa and Europe and Australia, like field hockey's huge. Millions and millions and millions of fans. Plus ice hockey, you have millions and millions oh, of fans. Oh, so you're so combining them. literally combining two sports. So that's kind of a cheat stat. But if you add squash to tennis, 
<laughs> it would not change anything. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think I'll allow it because if you think about the way, you know, just latitude works, you know, yeah. there, there are places where it's very difficult to make ice. Like the fact that hockey's in Alabama is weird. Yeah. So I think it makes sense. As far as the stick, the skates, the puck you were talking about, sticks, for what we know as the hockey stick today, uh, it is believed came from the Mimok, which if you said it and we just Americanized it, it would, sounds like Mikmok, but it's Mimok. They would go to, uh, what are they? They're called hornbeam trees. They were very hard trees. And when hockey sticks were first being made, they adopted how this Native American tribe would uh, make these sticks and started manufacturing their own. The company that started doing that was the Star Company. Um, and they started doing that, and I think it was the mid 1860s. And they started with. That's a super interesting tribe, Lee. There's theories about them being connected to the Knights Templar and ancient secrets and that they bred with Eric the Red's Vikings. Mm. And so it's a like Nova Scotian yeah. area yep. kind of tribe. That's right? exactly what, yeah. Yeah. In terms of Native American tribes and connectedness to all of the stories of the old world, mm -hmm. they might be the most interesting. They knew some stuff. Did I say their name correctly? I have no idea. I'll take the fall for that then. Yeah, I've <laughs> Mick Mick okay. Mick Mac. Yeah, so it is M I K M A Q. But the way when I was doing the research, they literally the the star company who started manufacturing the hockey sticks uh, after these findings literally named it M I C dash M A C Mick Mac after this Native American tribe. That's awesome. And man. so they started going in that. Um, I gotta say, I'm very impressed with well, where we're, what this episode is doing right now. I re I'm very happy, very Agreed. happy with this. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. And then uh, it went from that type of uh, it, that horn beam was called ironwood, but they were starting to run low on that, so they switched over to ash and maple, and they were doing what was called one piece sticks. Which I loved how the hockey stick evolved and kind of kind of did a full circle. A one piece stick is exactly what it sounds like. It, they they would take a piece of wood and literally carve out a hockey stick out of one piece of wood. Later on in nineteen or nineteen twenty, I believe they started doing two piece sticks. Uh, Hespler, which is a a, a Canadian hockey company um, or was, created the first two piece stick where they would take the shaft, a wood shaft, and then they would notch out the end, hollow out the end of the stick, and then they would take a wooden blade and insert glue, basically glue that inside. And that was a two-piece stick. And then Sherwood took that design, and they went from they took the two-piece stick, and then they wrapped it in fiberglass wrapping and melted that down. So it's composite at that point. It's, it's yes, got a, the inner yes. core is just to provide yeah. the shape, but the fiberglass mm -hmm. on the outside is what kind of gives yep. you the stiffness. And then in the night, early 1990s, the aluminum stick. Um, I don't know who the first maker of the aluminum hockey stick was. But I know Easton made it famous. Wayne Gretzky used to use them. Uh, they would use an aluminum shaft at the top where your knob was. They would have a wooden piece up there, and then the, the blade of your stick would be inserted into the bottom of the, the base of the stick. In 95, composites were made, and they made the composite stick, and that was still two-piece. But now, the sticks that are made now are literally all one piece of composite. So it literally just did a full circle went back to its roots with just better technology. So when I met Dr. Jeff Evans, however many years that was ago, he was testing hockey sticks for flex. Is mm -hmm. that the term? Yeah. And so the way it works is you have what's called a, a two-part beam supported, and you hang a certain amount of weight in the middle, mm -hmm. and the amount of deflection that you get from that simple supported beam scenario, that is a you, there's an equation, and you can quantify the flex of a hockey stick. Right. So... As you're talking about the evolution of the hockey stick as it goes along, started with wood and then it progressed forward, mm -hmm. how does the flex change? Like, have you played with all these types of sticks? Nope. I've only, I've played with, uh, Sherwood was a classic stick that I used growing up. Um, and it, that was the wood one? It was, it was wood, uh, wrapped in fiberglass. I had the Paul coffee, not a big deal. <laughs> he was, he was a famous hockey player, but he like, he had a legendary curve on his stick and so that that was his brand, and uh, I had a lot of those. The durability and the lightweight is the biggest difference for me from wood to composite. Matt, when, Matt, what did you play with? I played with composite sticks. Early on, I played with a 
two-piece composite stick where I could swap out blades if I wanted to. So I would tend to chunk up blades a little bit more, especially in roller hockey. What? You could swap just, out the I, blade? Like it it attached? But would yeah. it be as... Yeah. It, so if, it would affect your slap shot, right? Because it wouldn't be as rigid. No. So what? So when you're swapping those out, you take your torch, especially if you have an aluminum stick, which I hated, and you would warm up the shaft where the blade is inserted, let the glue melt. You know, if it's broken, you know, pull out, whatever. Sometimes you would have to drill in and usually get a screw or something, a bolt, like drill a screw in there and pull it out if you broke it off right at the base. But yeah, you could just swap out blades. You couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, I would swap out blades like that early on, and then I started buying one-piece composite blades after that. But I could not do the big, hooking, swooping, curved blade, man. I don't know how you played, but I tried to model my entire game after number 19. I'm sorry, the actual number 19. Steve Eiserman's great, too. <laughs> and Joe Sackick's signature was that lightning fast snapshot wrist shot. You didn't see a whole lot of, you know, Sackick drifts open on the left point. Puck slides across. He's unchecked. Here comes the massive slap shot. He'd just walk in. I mean, it was just so casual. He'd just walk in. The puck was always loaded when it was on Sackick's stick. And it blew my mind the first time in whatever it was, the early 90s, that I saw Joe Sackick fire off a goal. It, it looked like he didn't even move. I mean, it just, we're on Zoom here, so you can kind of see Destin. It just looked like this little flinch with yeah. his wrists. And here goes his rocket ball. And I think about how hard it is for me to generate that kind of speed in the other sports I play. And I was like, I want to be that guy. Yeah. He's a gentleman. He plays hard. He doesn't get into fights because he knows that's not going to play to his strong suit. He lets other people do it for him. And he fires off those wrist shots real quick. Yeah. And so what I found is, like, obviously a flat blade isn't going to get that done because you're not going to get the velocity off of the wrister. But those crazy curved blades like some people were playing with in the 90s when I was getting started, it was too much. I couldn't hit a target with it, and it felt like it was, everything was kind of shanky and weird. So I was definitely middle of the road on the curvature. But you were playing with the goofy curve blade? Yeah, uh, so... I learned... Are there rules? Like, I want to know if there are rules, like physical limitations on what you can do with the stick. Yeah. So, Zidane Ochara, who is, I think he's 6'8", he got a waiver because uh, you're only allowed so much for stick length. Uh, he got a waiver. I forgot how much more than the, the regulation size is. That's one. You're only allowed so long of a stick. But then also, two, there's how illegal you can curve your blade on a stick. Just for the simple fact of... The more curved it is, the more out of, I don't want to call it out of control, but the more out of control it could be. Like, the more you curve your stick, the toe tends to twist up on an angle. So when you're taking shots, mm -hmm. it naturally wants to go to the rafters. Goalies are in net, and they're constantly taking head shots. A player, if you want to look it up, who really rides the line on what's legal and illegal, if you look up Alexander Ovechkin's stick, He's probably the greatest modern scorer right now. He plays for the Washington Capitals. The, his bend on his curve of his blade is wild, and he's incredibly accurate, and I don't know how. Every player shoots different, which, you know, we'll get into that. So I have a question. I have always wondered about this. For me, part of the reason that I did not want the crazy curve on the blade is, you know, I'm playing center. I'm moving around a lot. I'm on both sides of the ice quite a bit, Yeah, which means that if I'm receiving a puck on the back of my blade, find myself in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I would always, it would just deflect and roll off the couple of times that I try to really curve stick. How do people who do this handle the backside of their blade? And how do they handle the puck without losing control? So it's all based off of player tendency. You're going to notice that players who have more of a curve like that, you're not going to see too many backhanded goals or shots or pass. Like, Alexander Ovechkin, who I just brought up, the guy has over 600 goals in his career, and it's because he sits in one spot, finds a way to break away from the defense, and with his stick back, ready, you know, to crack, you know, a one timer slap shot, he sets up in his office, and he's just, he's a sniper. He knows where that thing's going to go over, and it doesn't matter what, he's done it over 600 times, and nobody knows to just stay on him. Like, just stick, <laughs> but he finds a way to break free. 
And then he'll open up and he'll cock back that stick and don't let that pass get to him because it's going to go in. So 600 is a big number because hockey games, the score is typically like three to five or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That'd be a high scoring game. It's a high scoring game, but I mean. (laughs) Three to five would be a high scoring game? I mean, it's not that crazy nowadays, but it's it's a higher scoring game. Yeah, so let's call it three to two. Is your if it was five to three, you'd assume that it was a four to three game, and somebody got an empty netter. Four to three. So okay, yeah, seven legit goals. So yeah. please tell me what that means. I'm sorry, I don't understand. So an empty netter means at the end of the game you pull your goalie yeah. back over, right? So if you're if you're down a goal or two, whatever it is, and you got like a minute, minute and a half left in the game. When your team is in the offensive zone on the other side of the rink by their goalie, you pull your goalie to add an extra man on the ice when they're in in that zone. And hopefully having that extra man pays off. If it doesn't, well, you have an empty net and they're going to score again and basically put the game away. Is it a bet worth taking? I mean, is is that a gamble? Oh, yeah. There's a good chance that it, it works out. That extra player is a huge benefit to the team. And there's there's been plenty of time. Yes, that 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 works out. And that's why a power play is such a big deal. Yep, and we'll we'll dive more into a power play later. I've created many of them. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like a really funny joke, and I'm looking forward to understanding. Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, so I won't dive too far into the skates. The big marks for the skates was you've heard through the past of stories of literally the Dutch. The oldest pair of skates ever found was uh, in a I want to say uh, Switzerland lake. I don't know if this is true or not. But I believe the blade was made from a large animal's bone, and then there was two straps of leather that went around the front. Like they bore holes in the front and the back, and wrapped them around. And those were on dis- on display at some museum. But the huge step for hockey was in nineteen or 1866 when that same company, the Star Manufacturing Company, who produced the hockey stick, they also produced what was called the Star Blades. And these were blades that looked like a single hockey blade. And it actually clamped to your boot. And it basically turned your everyday boot into an ice skate. And those were what were used during the first like, original hockey game. Those first Micmac sticks as well as those star skates. Wait, wait, wait. So you, you can trace it back to the first game? Uh, yep, that's coming up right now. All right, do it. Oh, well, actually, the earliest, earliest pucks, uh, I'm sure Matt knows this, but uh, you wanted a flat surface. So they would use frozen uh, cow dung patties. Wow, so that, I did not know yeah, that. Those were the pucks, and then it went to. Sometimes they would use rocks when they couldn't, you know, when it wasn't winter, and they would bounce all over the place. So they started creating wood spheres, and they would cut them in the thirds, and then just keep the middle. And that's what actually the puck the, for the first hockey game in 1875 in Montreal. That's what they used. They used that wood stick, the Micmac stick, the star skates, and that wooden puck. You know, it's so fascinating because. It's not rolling. Rolling isn't necessary because you have a lower coefficient of friction. Mm-hmm. But it would make sense that the outer shape of the thing that we're going to hit back and forth on the stick, it would it would have to be a circle. Mm-hmm. If it was any other shape than that, then you wouldn't be able to predict where it goes. And so as I'm thinking in my mind's eye right now, I'm taking that puck and I'm putting it midway on the face of a, a stick and I'm pushing it forward, and it's going to naturally roll off the end of the stick. And at some point, when the stick and the puck decouples, it's going to travel on that tangent path. Yeah, is that true? Did I say all that correctly? It does, but you got to understand, it wasn't until 1927 when an Ottawa Senators player, I, th- I think his name, Cy Chinny, I, b- I believe is how you pronounce it, uh, was the first player to curve. The blade of his stick. Up until then, sticks were just straight. There was no curve in the blade. It wasn't until later on in the you know 40s and 50s when that started catching on, realizing that they could start shooting from the toe of the stick, which is the front of the stick, to get elevation on the puck to go up. Because in the early hockey, uh, the puck didn't leave the ice. I'm trying to think about what the curvature actually does. Obviously, you get more control. Right, you get more control. And not only that, but like when you have the toe of the blade as you're ha- as you're curving it, and you give it the slightest little curve like this, you like tilt, angle of attack. Yeah, exactly. And when you're shooting like that, you don't have to put so much emphasis on. You'll see young kids do this. They'll grab the puck. You'll see them bend the stick, and then they'll try it as they shoot. It looks like they're trying to lift it. 
Ah, you don't have to lift the puck. The blade's naturally lifting it for you. It's like a golf club. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, man. But but there's still some there's a there's a blank spot in my mind and I don't want to cover it now. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> or we'll, I'll just I just want to think about this one. Yeah. But like as it's rolling off the stick, does yeah. the curvature actually accelerate your ability to accelerate? It's like it's like an impulse kind of thing. Um Almost like a, and I and I could be saying this wrong. I know because a full rotation would be like centrifugal, but still that same science applied to a curve as it's coming off a a curved wall. Is that is that still like the same kind of force that I'm? Nobody cares. Could keep going. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> no, 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 nobody cares about the word. What, what are you saying? Is that is that what it does? So uh, well, yeah. So like literally, there's times like if I'm catching a pass off a stick and I catch it at the heel, which is the back of the blade, and I'm pulling when I'm shooting. I'm literally pulling the puck around and releasing off the toe of the stick. So I'm pulling the puck back with my heel, wrapping it around the curve of the blade and releasing from the toe of the stick. Got it. I, and the, the foot analogy really helps me. And that's also what they're called. Thank you both for, <laughs> uh, for going slow for me here. Yeah. Uh, now I want to get into when you brought up earlier, you said that I can trace it back to the first game. I can trace it back to the first indoor organized official game. And that was by a gentleman by the name of James Creighton. Uh, he was Nova Scotian, and Destin, you like him. He was an engineer, civil engineer, I believe. He went to King College as well as McGill University. He was a lawyer, a journalist. He was one of those guys at Thanksgiving. You hope you don't follow him when you know your parents are like, so what would you do this year? <laughs> like, the dude did everything. Um, Invented a sport. Oh, yeah, not a big deal. But uh, he was studying, working as an engineer, and in 1872... He moved to Montreal. He was huge into sports. And at this time, there was some, some of these informal games of hockey being played, like all these field hockey sports on ice and people were skating. He was a member at uh, a rink nearby called the Victoria Indoor Rink. And he was a member, so he started organizing these informal games in here. Well, in 1875, on March 3rd... You just pulled that out of your brain, didn't you? A little bit. Keep going. And he grabbed some of his rugby teammates, friends from his college, and some members that worked at the rink and created the first indoor game. They played two games. Now, I did have to write these down. They played by rugby rules, which means they could not pass the puck forward. It could only be passed back. Like, the, literally the only way to attack was to skate forward and stick handle. If you wanted to pass it, you had to pass it behind you like you do in rugby. Body checking was the only w real way to defend. They were uh, so hitting right out the gate was a part of the sport. The goals were like your typical nets that you see now. They were two posts that were eight feet apart. The goalies weren't allowed to drop or uh, kneel to stop the puck. They had to just stand there and with the stick or feet or whatever it was to stop the puck. Uh, and there were nine men per side, no substitutions for a full 60 minutes. What size was the rink? Um, that I could not find the dimensions of that rink. I feel like we could probably trace it back because it was called the Victoria Indoor Rink. James Creighton was responsible for organizing and putting on the sport. And um, here's another fun fact about that. That game was cut early. Actually, it was the second game that day. It was cut early because it ended in a fight, an all-out brawl. So literally the first <laughs> hockey game ever had a fight in it. So... And, um, and, and that makes why? you happy, right? Oh, it absolutely does. <laughs> okay, let, no, let's do this. Why? It's a joke, but also there's a reason, right? Well, there, that that and there is. makes you want to punch people. Like so I what said, is it? I, we'll, I'll, I got an enforcer piece in here, but okay. the game of hockey is very reactionary, and it's very emotional, and it's uh, there's different types of fight, and the reaction fight is one of them. You're going to be playing a game, and in that game, you're going to get pissed off. And things are going to happen. And, I mean, yeah, it's very much a part of the hockey DNA. And over the years, people have tried to remove it, which they may have the reasons or not, but it's a part of the game and it needs to stay. But you haven't fought anybody, right? What's that? As a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as a Christian, you've never fought anybody in hockey, right? It's before I was a Christian. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe any of this. When's the last time you punched somebody on the rink? Uh, punch somebody on the rink? We, it was uh, we ask him that in every episode. I got, I know, no, What's the last time you no, punched I got, somebody? In the, well, that's the thing. Is like in hockey, I don't count them. But uh, I was suspended. I, I would, last year in the playoffs, I was suspended because uh, I popped someone. 
Really? So, <laughs> yeah. This jersey, they actually hung up my jersey on the bench because um, <laughs> because I couldn't play. They try, We tried to dispute it, but... Matt, did you see his eyes go down in shame when he said that? <laughs> <laughs> so so here's the deal. What what did the guy do? What's uh so we were going back and forth, popping off at the mouth. Uh and it was one of those ones where like we were losing and I was just frustrated. I just wanted to hit someone. And he was the one who popped off the mouse <laughs> the mouth closest to me. So you just the fact that you can say, I just wanted to hit someone. And you could do it, and you yeah. did it. Well, I knew there was three minutes left in the game, and I was like, what are we going to do, kick me out? It's the end of the season. Or no, no, I'm sorry. We had one game left because that last game, it, while it does matter because you want to be there for your team, we were losing. We weren't going to go to the championship game. So I had one game left. So did you save it up? Like, did you save it to the end of the season? Oh, no, you never save it to the end of the season. It's just that's how that's how that turned out. Okay, so I genuinely don't understand this. Like, mm-hmm. You're playing basketball. Everything stops because somebody slaps your arm. Yeah. Nobody's ever hurt in basketball. If somebody gets hurt, it's a big deal. <laughs> so so what's the deal with hockey? Like, why can I just... It's two questions. Why can I punch somebody yeah. and I'm just going to be sent to the penalty box? And number two, yeah. why do the refs just sit there and watch it? So the refs are there to... You know, they're there with the guidelines, the rules, to enforce those rules. Those rules only go so far. Fighting and those who choose to fight, uh, the enforcers, they don't like being called goons, they are the on-ice police. At any moment, you could have players on the other team that are going to take cheap shots against your studs like Joe Sackick or you know your scorers, and when you do that, there's a consequence. Um, so to protect your more skilled players, to protect your goalie, to protect you usually have a guy on the team who's an enforcer who when they're on the ice, the other team knows it and they're not going to try to pull anything stupid. So this this term that you're using enforcer, this mm-hmm. is an accepted term. Oh yeah. It's a thing. Oh yeah. Cuz I remember watching the Huntsville Channel Cats years ago and number 22, if he got put in the game, I knew somebody was going to get punched and I didn't understand what I was watching. Yeah. So why why did they put 22 in the game? In what situation would they have done that? Multiple situations so like i said there's there's three types of fight you have a reaction fight which is you're in the heat of the moment of the game and you turn around and you just like you look at the other person let's drop them and you just start fighting there is a protection fight or a revenge fight where someone pulled a cheap shot on one of your more skilled players or did something to one of your teammates and either that game the next shift later in the period later in the game or even if it spills over and you wait until you play them again the next time and you fight them then, there's a protection slash revenge fight. Lastly, there's ones where there's just an agreement amongst enforcers where if you look at the bench and you can see there's no adrenaline, there's no the boys aren't motivated or hyped up, you line up with the other enforcer on the other team and go, hey, man, I need one. I need to get the boys going. You got Give me one. And Are they, you serious? And they will just agree to line them up and, and, and go. So if actually there was actually a really famous video on YouTube. George LaRock uh, was one of, uh, he was a great um, fighter. And uh, I forgot who the person was that lined up next to him. He kind of had that look in his eye and George was like, hey, you want to go? And the guy was like, yeah. He goes, all right, man, good luck. And then after that, they, they dropped a puck, they dropped their gloves and they squared off. It was a gentleman's agreement. Like, I need to get the boys going. I need to have a fight. Really? Mm-hmm. And so and so the enforcers will actually team up. Yeah. So it's not an act of aggression. No. It is it is cooperation. And there there can be. There's times where the enforcer loses his mind and you know it is out of aggression and it's very reactionary, but for the most part like that enforcer role is a brotherhood. There's a fantastic documentary out called Ice Guardians. It goes over the role of enforcer from multiple angles, from the player's angle, from the fan's angle, from the coach's angle, all the way to the psychologist and neurologist that are studying the brains as to why they agree with why this role should be there or shouldn't be there. People think that, and don't get me wrong, head injuries have come from fighting, right? But a lot of the concussions you see in today's game come from the hits. You have... 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", 250-pound guys yes. flying on ice. When they collide, you know, that brain's smacking off the skull, and uh, that's what's causing concussions. Don't get me wrong. Some head injuries have come from fighting, 
but a majority of the concussions are coming from the big hits. Yeah, there's plenty of fighters out there that I know that have next to no concussions compared to like Sidney Crosby, who's a very talented hockey player. He suffered, you know, I think three uh, major concussions. It's because you, when you're that good, you're a target. And that's why you need those enforcers out there to protect those guys. So if you're going to play hockey, people are going to get their heads knocked around. It's the nature of the yep. game. The question is, if you if you want to sit around and take the myopic look at it and say, well, we got this many head injuries from fighting, which is minuscule. You hardly ever hear about that. Mm-hmm. Well, then you know you can clutch your pearls and get really upset about these mean boys with mullets punching each other. But if you take the time to understand the sport, you understand that the occasional head injury that might come from fighting offsets uncountable more head injuries that would come from unchecked hits into the boards, blindside hits, stick work that gets up a little bit high that goes unnoticed. The fact that you have an enforcer in a sport that moves on arts, yeah. but you don't have one in sports that move on lines. The fact that you have to have an enforcer in a sport where the most pounds of pressure per square inch, the greatest force player maybe in the history of ever, is the smallest player ever. Paul Correa, he could move the fastest. I mean, the amount of impact a dude that small can dish out at that speed, that's still 145 pounds moving at the speed of a Toyota. It hurts so, a lot. I mean, you can just you can maul each other against the boards, and with no enforcement, with no fear of repercussion, I think you would see a vastly larger amount of head injuries. So I think it's a good trade-off. And that same player, Paul Correa, in uh, the 2003, uh, 2002-2003 playoffs, uh, it was the fourth round, game six, and the New Jersey Devils, who Scott Stevens played for, who he's known as the biggest hitter of all time. If Scott Stevens was on the ice, know where he is. Well, his big move was if you were coming down the left side – of the boards into the offensive zone where he's protecting and you cut to the middle at his blue line, he would meet you there. For some reason, when you're making that move to cut to the middle of the ice, you know, you're looking down at the puck to kind of stick handle or look for a play to develop. And he would catch you there. And no man has sent more people off the ice on a stretcher than Scott Stevens. And in 2003, Paul Correa, one of the most talented players in the game at that time came up the left side of the boards. He cut to the middle and he passed the puck but he kept his head down, and Scott Stevens laid him out. He was knocked unconscious, and the camera panned over his helmet, and you could actually watch when his when his eyes opened back up, like his whole body jolted, like he was in no man's land. Help me understand that. Like, mm-hmm. so you have, I guess, what I need to understand is checking. Yeah. So checking is when uh, one person hits another person with their body. So I Correct. understand the fighting thing. Yeah. And and the purpose of the enforcer, as you explain, Matt, is to prevent over the top checking and hurting other players is that do i understand Correct. correctly dirty stuff dirty yeah. stuff okay so yeah. so what is checking and how does it happen and when is it appropriate so normally when you're always going to see a hit a hit it, it's called a dump and chase and that's when the team with the puck is going into the offensive zone will dump the puck into the corner And then the centerman will come from one approach, and whether it's the left side or right side, the right winger will come from the other, and they'll go into the corner after the puck, trying to trap the puck in that zone. Okay, this is going to make sense to you and me, but this is, is, I think, one of the trickiest, most confusing parts about hockey. So let's do this now in service of Destin's question. Okay. In order to score, generally speaking, you have to get into the offensive zone. Mm -hmm. Getting into the offensive zone is hard. What are the different ways that you can get the puck into the offensive zone, and why is that hard to do? So first way is if you just have a talented player who has the speed and skill to stick handle his way into the offensive zone and has his you know players with him on his line join him, you can do what I just referred to as the dump and chase, which is right now the most common way to get the puck into the offensive zone. And that's where, like I said, you dump the puck into one of the corners, chase it and a center and a winger are attacking from two different ways and basically trapping a defenseman into defending himself and getting the puck out to his forwards to go the other way. When you're in those corners, you most of the times have a defenseless defenseman with the puck and they're usually lighting them up against the boards. If you have players skating up along the boards, past the bench and the boards, 
you're hitting those on the boards. Uh, the so, so the defensive people with the, forgive me. So yeah, you, go ahead. I, I guess I even need this. I got the goalie at the goal. I got the forwards. They're out front. Yeah. They're doing the offensive stuff. Who are the yeah. other people? All right. So I'm here. Here's how we can do this. If you if you guys want, um, this will be the easiest thing. I literally came up with an NDQ team. Okay. That will break oh. down each position, each player, and explain using your guys's personality. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So at starting center, because well, I still play, and I think we can all agree. I know you played center, Matt, and but I'm your center. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. When it comes to positions, you got a centerman, you have a left wing, you have a right wing. That is your line. That's your that's your offensive attacking line. Those three. Okay. The centerman can go anywhere he wants. He's shortstop. He, that's right. He can follow that puck wherever he wants. The left winger, his assignment is along the left boards or in front of the net. The right wing is the same thing. Right side, right boards, attacking up all the way through the neutral zone, which is this spot of ice between the blue lines. That is, tra- you're transitioning from the defensive zone into the offensive zone. In between the blue lines is a neutral zone. That right side and left side is all the wingers. Is that just the way everybody does it, or is that the rule? That's how the positions are. Okay, got it. it. Keep going. Uh, they can break free and go a little and you know, cheat a little bit and go, you know, different areas. But the right side is theirs. Left side, is, you know, belongs to the left winger. Got it. Uh, then you have two defensemen and a goalie. When it comes to roles, we just discussed the enforcer, which I'm going to jump back to that after this. So there's six people on the ice for my team. Correct. So Five of them are constantly shifting out and changing lines. So I got three people that are in the back for defense. One of front, which... Front, two in the de- in defense, one is a goalie. Okay. So it's three, two, one. Okay. Three offensive forward, two defense in the back, and the goalie is at the goal. And he's that goalie it. is not really considered defense. They're no, just the goalie. He's the tendy. Okay, got it. All right, and then uh, there's roles within. So you, people hear these positions, but there's roles on a team. Uh, like for me, for a long time, I was a playmaker as well as uh, I was an agitator. I was a guy that, you know, Steve Eisman was my hero growing up, but I realized I was never going to be a Steve Eisman. I was a talented kid, uh, but I learned at an early age if I could get under the skin and control the temperament and the emotions of the other team, we would win that game. I could do things or say things that people would not agree with. A lot of people listen to this really. Like, <laughs> why, why do I have this guy on? Like, what? But I would, you know, cheap shots, saying things. People are already like that. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and what I, I'm doing it to draw a penalty. And if I draw can, a penalty from the other side. That's right. And uh, that, that puts us up on the power play, which again, I told you, I, I said I had a knack for putting my team up. So yeah. you're popping off with the mouth. You're talking non-stop. about his mom. Nonstop. Anything. I would watch kids walk in the arena with mom, sisters, grandma. It didn't matter what it was. Oh, dear. I was. <laughs> it didn't matter. So you're was, literally doing intel. Oh, I do. They, I have homework. I did homework. I went to school with a lot of these kids that played. Okay. I would use grades. Anything I could have, I would run my mouth. And my actually, for a long time, my dad, he knew that I was a very talented hockey player. And he hated that. I enjoyed that side of the game, the physical side, being an agitator, running my mouth, but it's just how I played, and I enjoyed playing it. He actually grounded me for two weeks. We were heading to a hockey game, and he said, if you hurt somebody or get a penalty for unsportsmanlike, you're grounded for two weeks. And uh, I think within the first period, it was a clean hit. It really was a clean hit. There was a kid against the boards, and he was just looking down too long, and I lit him up, and uh, he he got hurt. And uh, I went to the box, and I looked at my dad, and he just held up two fingers, and I was like, come on. (laughs) <laughs> but, well, was your dad in the right? Maybe he meant um, <laughs> I think every dad wants their kid to be the Steve Eiserman, the Joe Sackick, the humble, noble warrior that goes out. And he's good at what he does. He's the leader of the team, but he's got that quiet leadership demeanor. I wasn't that kid. And I found out early. I, I loved the, the aspect of the game. Of, That's not what I asked, Lee. What's That's that? Not- I asked if your dad was in the right for grounding uh, you for oh, two yeah. weeks. I, th- I think so, yeah, because if uh, my son becomes a hockey player, I want him to be a scorer. I want him to be sackic. Like, I don't want him to be like me. you know. But I fell in love with uh, my favorite player growing up with, was Darcy Tucker, and he was 5'9", 180 pounds on a good day soaking wet, but he was 110 miles an hour. He never shut his mouth. He was buzzing around the ice. He hit everybody, and he could still score. The two best that do it now are – Brad Marchant and, in my opinion, Matthew Kachuk. 
And without those guys, you don't have Steve Eiserman. So it's nice that dads want their kids to be Joe Sackick and Steve Eiserman. But Joe Sackick and Steve Eiserman would get obliterated and torn apart by monsters if there weren't monsters in their corner looking out for them, agitating, opening up opportunities with power plays, getting other mm. people off their game so that people like Steve Eiserman and Joe Sackett can get all the credit and do the pretty stuff. I'm starting to see the Matrix, guys. Like, this is, yeah. I'm starting to understand, and it's very exciting. Like, I'm, I, yeah, I got punched for just smiling at a guy. <laughs> I just kept smiling. Could see. Yeah, I, I, I just kept smiling at him, and uh, he was saying things to me that I can't say in this mic right now. Say it. Why- Whatever we'll beep it if we have to. What did he say? Oh, he, he uh, he's like, why are you staring at me like that? What do you? Uh, and so. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we're gonna beep it. Yeah, so, we're gonna beep that. <laughs> and I just, yeah, I just kept smiling. <laughs> just keep smiling, and sure enough, uh, apparently I got a smile that'll make you want to hit me. And it, because here's the thing is. <laughs> He hit me because he knew what I was doing, and there was nothing he could do about it. Oh, I was at- you were reverse judo in him. So he was saying things to you to get you mad, just like you do to other people. Mm-hmm. And you demonstrated with the smile that you were invincible to that level of yeah. attempt. And so you reverse judoed him, and you yeah. got the power play. <laughs> Wrong prey, buddy. Wrong prey. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So that's so, deep. There's multiple levels here. Yeah. And... You know, I fell in love with that side of the game, and you know, like I said, the old man didn't like it, but I, it stuck with. It. Actually, not too long ago, we were in a tournament, and we I actually had a player skate up to my team and say, "Again, you're going to have to beat this." He told my team, "We will give you anything if you can get number eight to shut the up." Really? And he was like, "That's impossible because he doesn't shut the up on our bench." <laughs> <laughs> so they they were. I've had my own team tell me to shut up. Really. I talk on the ice, I talk on the bench, I talk in the penalty box, I'll talk in the parking lot, I'll just keep running my mouth. And, and it's because you're embarrassing them? Mm, I'm not so, I mean, I can, but it's, I'm trying to annoy. I'm trying to get under skin, I'm trying to get you to the point to where you want to hit me and make a mistake. I want you to fail your team. Wow. Okay, okay. And so... I could and, not do this. Okay, so clearly I'm not the center... It's just as simple as no, 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 no. no. That's not. That, that's a role. A center is a position. The agitator, a playmaker, those are roles. I couldn't do this. I could not do this role. Do you remember? Do you remember a friend of ours in our small group that we were in who said, "I wish I could be confrontational like that." Confront- and I told my exact words were, "All you need to do is get your ass whooped one good time, right. and know what it's like, and realize that's it, and you'll be fine." Yeah, that's the worst that can happen. Yeah, and he looked at me like, yeah, no. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. (laughs) But uh, so. Okay, I concede. You're the center. I'm at ease with this, but I'm interested. I'm interested to know why Destin is going to be the goon. And I I did the whole NDQ squad. So, Destin, uh, I got you starting at right wing. Okay. And your role, you're my playmaker. A playmaker, they got great vision, they can see the ice. As much as people think Gretzky was, you know, a sniper and a score, he wasn't. He could see the ice better than anybody. And what that means is you know where all your opposing team is. You know where your teammates are going to be. You know where they're going to be before they're going to be there. Okay. You can see a play develop to reach that goal of scoring. Okay. When talking with you, whether we're on the podcast or one-on-one, you have this amazing ability. You have a goal. There's an end game that other people can't see, and you have this great ability to maybe use others or set up others to reach that end game goal. So that's why I got you as that playmaker on my squad. You're playing right wing. You see the play develop. You're my playmaker. What am I looking for? What what am I trying? What is my goal? Obviously, get the puck in the goal. But yeah, am I trying to set you up or am I trying to set yep. up the guy on the left wing? You're looking to set up guys like Matt. A- am I looking to shoot myself? You can, but that's the best part about a playmaker. They know when to shoot, and they know they got the vision of the ice, and they know when to pass. Roger that. It's all decision making. Got it. I'm on it. Matt, I got you as my sniper, buddy. Uh, a sniper uh, usually <laughs> has a very powerful, accurate shot, both snapshots, slap shots. They have this really good ability to remove themselves away from the defense and patiently wait for the right mop- opportunity, pick out a spot, and put that puck exactly where they want to to score. That's why they're called a sniper. When I hear Matt speak or deliver information, it is such an exact 
and precise way. And it's, there's been times on the podcast where I'm hearing you guys talk and Matt's being quiet and I can almost hear, like you get, I can just visualize him patiently waiting for him to take his shot at the top of the left circle. He's just sitting there with the stick cocked back, waiting for you to pass him the puck, and then he just buries it. Back on defense, put her on the left side, Miss Amy. So I have her as a, there, there's a few names for it. You got defensive uh, defenseman, a shutdown defenseman, or a stay home at defenseman. That means they're good at defense. They're good defensive-minded. They focus on their craft. They don't leave that. They have the discipline to own that position. And when she came in and just killed it, talking about uh, Amelia Earhart and as a historian and what she does and her focus on her craft and her discipline to hit all points, nobody's getting around that girl. I mean, she, she has got it down. Dalen, I got him back on defense, and uh, Dalen's as far as his role goes, I call him a two-way defenseman. Two-way defenseman, uh, like the Bar- Bobby Orr's of, of the world. Bobby Orr was considered something he's the greatest, but he's one of the greatest players of all time. And a two-way defenseman doesn't always just focus on defense. He can literally take the puck and quarterback a play from behind his other players. He can see the whole ice from behind and set up if he wants to. He can take it himself, but he has enough skill and speed to where he can leave his defensive position to create an offensive situation, but has enough skill to get back and transition back into position. Dalen, every time I've heard you guys talk with him or on YouTube or whatever it is, that dude has so much ability to move forward. And like, like let's say you're talking about a main topic. He can feed on that and go in. And the way that guy speaks is ridiculous. I could listen to him all day, but at the same time, he can leave that position, go verbatim word for word and quote a poem from the 1800s and then smoothly transition back in without missing a beat, without, you know, losing sight of the main point. So, he's my two-way defenseman. Now, we don't have a goalie. We can find one if you want, but goalies are a little different. Oh, we got, not, we got a goalie. Who's that? Tina. Tina. Here's the thing. I don't want to offend oh, Tina. I, like I, I don't want to offend Tina. I've never and she might even agree with this. I've never met a goalie who wasn't a little off. <laughs> uh, okay, well, it's settled. Uh, like Tina goalies, is. the Tina goalies is not off. Tina is the no. most dialed person. No, 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 no. I, like goalies are great people. They're kind. They're just built different. The wires don't cross the same way. They, they're willing to stand in front of a six ounce frozen piece of vulcanized rubber going 108 miles an hour. And smile about it, and like that's Tina. Yeah. yeah. So, so Tina takes what we do here on the podcast, and she's going to listen to everything we said, and everything we drop. Like when we have just totally not done our jobs. When I didn't see it correctly up there on the forward right wing. Yeah. When Matt missed the sniper shot, whatever it is. When yeah. when Amy and Dalen, they're you know they're overwhelmed. We got Tina getting this got her back. When Lee is on the ice and he 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 let, he lets a <laughs> bomb go. <laughs> To get under the other side. <laughs> like that one. Yeah. She's <laughs> so Tina's literally going to have to clean that up. Yeah. She's a goalie. She's getting away and getting in the way of these shots. I like it. All right. We have a goalie. Last line of defense. Last line of defense is Tina. There we go. <laughs> That's awesome. This is so, this really was that effective, was beautiful. dude. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so back to the enforcer role, because I think it is important, because I think it's very misunderstood. Enforcers are legitimately, yes, they're known as the enforcers and goon, which, again, they don't like, and just fighters, and some will say they're not even hockey players. They are the glue to a hockey team. Those are true locker room guys. They love their teammates. That's why they're doing it. You don't stand in the line of fire and and take punches to the face for people you don't care about. Enforcers, there's people out there who literally, yeah, they're playing hockey, but have fought their way to the NHL, and that's just what they do. My favorites were Bob Probert. I think Bob Probert was the greatest of all time. In uh, 91, he fought uh, Troy Crowder. He fought him, I think, four times. In this fight, they start going at it, and towards the end, Probert just lands two bombs. One, the punch is so hard, the the helmet goes flying off. And the second one uh, was an uppercut, and the lights went out. I mean, he just destroyed him. Uh, number two, Ty Domi. I loved watching Ty Domi fight. Ty Domi. <laughs> he, Ty, he's, yeah, Ty, he's like Ty Domi's an inch taller than me. Yeah, he's my size. <laughs> like, he is not a big dude. 
and uh, he fought anyone. Probert was considered the best, and he went at it twice with Probert. And the first time was in uh, 92. They squared off. Ty Domi was playing for the Rangers, Bob Probert with the Red Wings, and Ty Domi wanted him. He wanted the belt. He kept running his mouth, I'm going to fight him, I'm going to fight him. For anyone who fought Bob Probert, he did amazing to the point to where, like, even I'll admit, I, he won that fight. And he skated off doing the whole heavyweight champion belt. Uh, did motion. he really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. It's one of the historic NHL fights. Um, you got uh, Chris Knuckles Nyland. He's a legendary Canadians player from Montreal. Uh, just absolutely would go at it with anyone. He didn't care who it was. He didn't care if you were a skilled player, another enforcer. He protected his team. Uh, he was amazing. He started this huge brawl, huge brawl in uh, 1986. One of the biggest rivalries in hockey is Montreal versus Boston. Huge rivalry. Forgive me, what are the team names? The Montreal Canadiens and the Boston Bruins. Okay. And so they're playing, and Nylon gets kicked out of the game for basically trying to start a fight, but he got the boot. As he's leaving, the exit way literally goes by both benches. And he takes a swing at someone on the Bruins bench. This fight erupts into a team fight that led all the way back into the dressing room, down the hallway. It, the fight left the ice. The whole team is fighting down <laughs> the hallway into the dressing room. And it was just this massive brawl. Another guy, uh, his name's Derek Bugard, the boogeyman. He was a monster. His famous fight was in uh, 2006, he fought Todd Fedorik, who played for the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. Bugard played for the Minnesota Wild, and I want to say it was in the second period, Fedorik was trying to go after him for a big hit that Bugard put on one of Fedorik's teammates. And he kept wanted to fight, wanted to fight, wanted to fight, and finally they dropped the gloves, and Bugard literally broke his face. His orbital bone, his cheekbone, nose and jaw were all smashed. He had to have titanium plates put in his face. These guys are monsters, and they're good at what they do, but they are very misunderstood. And a goon, or an enforcer, a goon, whatever you want to call him, doesn't have to necessarily stay at the fighting level. Like the big hitters of the world, like Scott Stevens that I brought up earlier, you can have a guy on the ice that they know are huge hitters, big hitters, that is just as effective. Uh, another one was Nicholas Cronwall. It was literally called being Cronwalled. When they verb your name, you know it's legit. Exactly. <laughs> Something worked out. <laughs> uh, the Western Conference Finals, Game 3, 2009, Detroit's playing Chicago, Chicago Blackhawks, and Marty Havlat puck comes around the boards, and Nicholas Cronwell had this weird way to hit people where, remember how I told you Scott Stevens would wait at his blue line until you came to him? Mm -hmm. Nicholas Cronwell would meet you at yours. He would leave his position and come up and destroy you. There was a lot of times where he had this weird way of hitting you where he'd fly up and then he would turn his back to you, leading with his button back first, and just destroy you. And this is what uh, happened to Martin Havlight. He came up the boards, and Nicholas Cronwall was there to meet him and knocked him out cold. Out so cold. The lights are out. So I've, I've heard you talk about lights are out. I've he heard you talk about all these fights. Yeah. Has anyone ever been killed playing hockey? Um, or paralyzed? Or uh, So this is a – I don't want to say it's a great story, but uh, I, I want to say it was the, the Minnesota Wild, and I can't re remember the player's name. But during a game – not from a fight or a hit, his heart literally stopped on the bench. Like he had, I think he had a heart attack of some sort. And he actually was at some like his heart tw stopped twice while he was laying there on the bench. They brought him back. They sat him up. Everything's going again. Of course, they had to remove him from the game. But the first words he said when he came back were, when's my next shift? Really? That's, the, again, the difference between hockey players and any other sport. We don't know what turf toe is or a rolled ankle or a... You know, Patrice Bergeron played in the Stanley Cup Finals with, I think it was, I forgot how many broken ribs, a punctured lung. Like, it's a point of pride to where I don't care how hurt I am, I'm still playing. Jeremy Roenick, he literally had his entire jaw shattered when he played for uh, Phoenix. Came back on the ice. Just went out there, basically stitched him up a little bit, and he, he said he could literally move pieces of jaw. That's awesome. Okay, so. so so you've mentioned is it? Yeah, it is awesome. <laughs> it, it, it is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 incredible. All right, buddy. In this second spot here on this unsponsored episode, uh, I think it's appropriate to tell everybody that you have a podcast, a daily podcast, as a matter of fact, and you have had one for what a year now. 
Uh, yeah, going on a year and a half. Yeah. So uh, I can't believe we haven't mentioned this yet, but uh, you have a daily podcast called the Ten Minute Bible Hour, which I think is kind of like your final form for your specific content. Like you've got the YouTube channel, TMBH Ten Minute Bible Hour YouTube channel, but you know I've always felt like the podcast is the way that content needs to get out there. Yeah. Well, and what's happened is the video side has naturally evolved more toward things that need video to tell the story. And then what happened is it just made a ton of sense to do a daily podcast. It's hopefully fun and short and fits into people's schedules to talk about the actual content of the document like a normal human. Yeah. So a couple of questions about the 10 Minute Bible Hour podcast. Where yeah. did the music come from? I mean, some of it sounds <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, where'd it come from? Okay, my friend Jeff, who I've known since college, who is a musical wizard, he made all of the music for it. And some of it is from his most recent album that he did. He let me grab all of the instrumental tracks and pick and choose what I wanted. So I picked a different track for every day of the week. And it's on a rotation. And so I, as podcasts go, it's the second best introductory music to any podcast that I'm aware of <laughs> anywhere on the internet. Oh, th this being, which is notum questions one. being the first, I see, yeah. Well, I mean, well, <laughs> it's just so catchy, honestly. It does get in my head. So he does that, and then every now and then he does Easter egg outros, where I'll tell him, like, oh, I did this today, and I vaguely referenced this song from 1997. And he'll be like, I'm on it. And then he goes and makes some, like, pastiche homage that is evocative of this song or that song, and then everyone has fun guessing what the Easter egg reference is. The Zelda music was amazing. Yeah. I had nothing to do with it, but I loved it. Yeah. It's like a hip-hop urban Hyrule theme. Yeah. Yeah, it worked for me, too. Yeah, so so let me give you a couple compliments here. So compliment number one, I really like the conversational tone you take on TMBH Podcast. I also like the fact that we do a podcast together and for a year and a half, you have never requested mentioning that podcast on this podcast, which is a testament to your humility. And um, I am the one that is suggesting we talk about it here because you never have even suggested that. And that says a lot. So 10 Minute Bible Hour podcast, what do you think? We leave a link down in the show notes or how do you want to do this? Yeah, I, I think that sounds great. And I, I think you did mention it once sometime okay. last year. I, I think it came up somewhere along the way. I mentioned it? I think you did. I don't know. We make a lot of podcasts, man. Oh, okay. To my knowledge, you've never requested that we mention it on this podcast. And No, no, not that I recall. That says a lot. That's yeah. nice of you to say. Thank you. We have had a lot of conversations, and for you to have never... I mean, clearly you can gain from that, but yeah, it's a pretty big deal that you never did that. So yeah, TMBH Podcast, I highly recommend it. Even if you're not a Christian and you don't care about the Bible, it's interesting because you get to think about the Bible in process. It's, if I understand correctly, you call it the Bible without the sermon. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the idea. And the point is that I get if you go to somebody's church or any expression of a religion, that what you're doing is tacitly agreeing to have whoever runs that tell you things about life and give you counsel and advice. But the Internet's a different animal, and I don't want it to feel like just because you stopped by my podcast, that is somehow permission for me to now tell you how all the things are. I would much rather just try to baseline in a fun way the raw materials of what the text we're looking at says. And then, I don't know, what you do with it. That's that's your thing. That's awesome, man. TMBH Podcast, go check it out. I'll leave a link in the show notes, and you can just search for it on any podcast player. It's there. Thanks for bringing that up, buddy. So before we get too far into this, I went to a hockey game a while back with some friends who had not watched hockey before, and they were pretty overwhelmed by all the lines. The whole rink is bisected by a red line. Then it's cut into a third with a pair of blue lines, and they were confused by why play would <coughs> stop when players on offense skated into one end of the rink too quickly. They didn't understand why. That was called offsides. Everybody who I go to hockey games with for the first time is baffled by what icing is when a player down by their own goal on defense gets a puck on their stick and they just wing it to the end, other end of the rink. Like, why do we stop play there? What is that about? Like, obviously, I think everybody gets that the point of hockey is to score more goals than your opponent. 
by hitting the puck into your opponent's net. But can you just walk us through those two confusing parts of hockey for the outsider looking in? What is offsides? What is icing? And how does that relate to the lines that are painted on the rim? Thank you for this question because this is important for me. I have no idea what these things mean. Yes, absolutely. Let's see if we can break this down. All the circles you see, Mm -hmm. the two on each side of the ice and the big one in the middle, those are face-off circles. So when play stops and needs to continue, that's where the ref drops the puck and they face off for the puck. The lines on the ice, the two far lines on each end that go across the front of the net is called the goal line. That's important for icing, which I'm going to bring up to you in a second. The two blue lines are used for offsides, and literally that red one down the middle, that's also used for icing. So when it comes to offsides, let's say you and Matt. We got our team set up, so tell me. Yep, yeah. So you and Matt, uh, you're a playmaker. You're heading up the ice, heading into the offensive zone. So the offensive zone is where their goalie is. So the blue line closest to their goalie is their blue line. As you go into the offensive zone. Which is beyond the blue line. Yet, the puck has to cross that blue line first. If any player crosses that blue line before the puck, that's offsides. Okay. Because that's like in basketball, you'd call that. So the puck has to be the first thing into the offensive zone. Yep. Can you skate backwards with the puck behind you and pull it into the offensive zone? Negative. However, the puck can cross first, but the player who is trying to stay on sides can drag his leg. It doesn't necessarily, your whole body, except for your toe, can be over the line. But as long as your toe is still behind that blue line, it's still on sides. It's when you're literally the player's full body is over the line before that puck. Okay, so slow down just a little bit, please. Okay. So I've got five lines on the ice. I have a center line, Mm -hmm. and then I have two blue lines. If I'm going symmetry, so Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut the rink in half with the center line, which is what color? Red. Red. Then I go out, like I'm going towards the left and the right at the same time, and there's a blue line on each side there. Mm -hmm. And that is the name of that is? The blue line. Bl- it's just called the blue line. The, the blue line, but those are meant for offsides. Marks the offensive zone, and it's very thick to give you the opportunity to drag so that mm-hmm. you can stay on sides. So it's a thick line. So yeah. anything beyond the blue line is the offensive zone. Okay. Yes, okay. if you're attacking. Okay. Yes. And then beyond that, I have red lines, and they're like right yep. in front of the goal. Yep. The center line, the red one uh, that we just talked about that divides the ice in two, and the goal lines, the red ones that go in front of it, those are meant for icing. Okay. So blue icing, line is for offsides, red lines are for icing. Correct. Got it. Okay. What icing removes from the game is the cherry picking. So the rule is is if I have the puck and I'm behind that red line closer to my goalie and I shoot the puck and it goes past your goal line and you get there before me and the other player gets there before me touches it first, that's icing. No, I didn't get it. Don't understand it. Okay, this is the this is the one a lot of people have a hard time with. Can I can I explain so, offsides to you real quick? To yeah, make sure go I have ahead. It? Yep. So we've got the NDQ hockey team there, mm-hmm. right? And so uh, Amy makes a defensive play, passes it over to Dalen. Dalen pushes it up to me, mm-hmm. and I see Matt starting to break towards the goal, and Matt yep. crosses the blue line before I can pass it to him. That would be offsides. Matt is an idiot. Yeah. Is it, did I do that correctly? That's correct. Okay, so now if you led him, geez. if you pass the puck ahead of him and the puck crosses first, and then he crosses, you know, before you do, but the puck, yeah, that's totally. So if fine. I held it too long, yes. So, so so offsides doesn't happen. It, it's a, it's a combination. It's one person holding it too long, or it's another person trying to snowbird and get down there. First. You have to be very aware in the sport of hockey where that puck is at all times. So so Matt. On the left wing and I on the right wing, we have to be communicating non-verbally. One of the biggest things uh, that, I, like right now, I'm uh, coaching, and one of the biggest things I try to explain to my players is the communication on the ice. Constantly be talking, screaming, clapping your stick, making noise. Let your not everybody has that natural playmaker vision, so they have to be able to hear you. Okay. So if you're if you're flying up the ice and you got your head down staring at this puck, Matt's screaming over to you. You know, up, up, you know, screaming up, like like pass it up 
or, you know, you're alone, blah, 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 letting you know nobody's chasing you, or you got one, you got one, you got one. That means you got someone behind you that's coming up. So his eyes are my eyes. Exactly. You all have to feed off one another. Okay, got it. So I understand offsides. So Matt and I have to communicate as we push Mm -hmm. forward. There would never be a situation where Amy or Dalen in the back would be offsides. No, because, yeah. Because they're they're, they're on the defensive side. Exactly. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, the, the the defense can be. The defense can do it, um, especially Dalen being a two-way uh, who can typically likes to leave his defensive position and move up. He can. It would be a weird situation for Tina because that just there's multiple infractions there. <laughs> Got it. Understood. Yeah. Okay, so that's offsides. Got it. Yep. Icing. Let's start slow on icing. I know icing okay. has to do with the red lines, yep. which there's a red line in the middle, and then there's a red mm-hmm. line closest to each goal. So... Red line cuts ice in half. Let's say you have the puck and your team is on your side of uh, of the ice, your half of the ice where your goalie is. Okay. If you shoot the puck from behind that red line towards the other, like you just dumped the puck and cleared it, and it went past that red line that they call the goal line, if your goalie raises his hand and it's an obvious offsides, or if the other team touches it first before you get there, that's offsides. It's to prevent... Cherry picking. No, nope, no, nope, you said offsides. Isn't that icing? Did I say offsides again? <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry. So, I meant to say icing. I'm sorry. Uh, the mental image. Draw the, let's try this one more time. Yep. So I've got the red line that cuts the rink in half, and I got the two red mm-hmm. lines closest to the goal. Mm-hmm. And they have to do with icing. I know this now that yep. you taught me this. What? Okay, first of all, what is icing, first of all? And, and then secondly, why is it bad? Or why would they have to make a rule against it? Icing uh, is is a rule that prevents cherry picking. So let's. What say do you mean it, by cherry picking? It prevents cherry picking and it prevents continual dumping of the puck and clearing the puck. It it is an interruption to the game. So oh okay so so t- you mean it, it keeps people from just going down exactly. and standing in front of the net and being like yeah, hey hey yeah. hey I'm on offense so, get it yeah. to me. So instead of having players just all the way down on the other side of the ice waiting for the puck and you, you know you're trying to constantly dump it, it it gives a more Fair play to both sides. That would be offsides, though, right? Yes, it does. But also, another w- a reason for it is, let's say, if I go up... Oh, one... oh, I think I understand. If Matt and I were to camp out at the blue line, mm-hmm. and then other people would just sling it on the way down to the end. Yep. Is that... And that, not only that, but let's say you guys went up one nothing, right? Well, now you're up one nothing. And you just chuck the puck down the ice every time you touched it. There's no need to even try to do any yes. type of offensive play. You're just throwing the puck down there every time. So basically, the yes. result or consequence to icing the puck is you now have a faceoff in your own zone closest to your goalie. Oh, I understand why. I'm, this is so confusing. Offsides is something that happens toward the opposite team's goal. Icing is something that happens closer to my goal. Yeah. All of this comes down to one concept that I think is really tough for not hockey players to understand, and that is that in basketball, for example, there's no effort to gaining the offensive zone. You can score from wherever. You just dribble the ball up the court. Maybe somebody hassles you a little bit, but everybody gains the offensive zone. One of the really unique things about hockey is that in order to get into scoring position, you have to gain the offensive zone. So there's this little game within a game that if you don't play hockey, you don't understand. It's all the middle stuff, the the transition game, the neutral zone game, where it muddles around and you're like, what are we yeah. really doing here? Well, the rules are made so that being in the offensive zone is a privilege that requires incredible coordination and teamwork to achieve. So if there were no icing and you're on defense the other team does all this work and coordination to breach the neutral zone, to obtain the blue line, to obtain the offensive zone. Now they've finally done the work to gain it. For one half a second as a defender, then you get a stick on the puck and you just wing it to the other end. Ha ha, suckers, go start over. It forces you to control the puck on defense and in a controlled way move the puck out into the neutral zone, go into transition and go try to gain your offensive zone instead of just lazily throwing the puck away and making for unwatchable, miserable hockey. So, Matt, are you saying that offsides is a penalty against the offense and icing is a penalty against the defense? No. No, they're... Oh, God, I thought I had... No, they're both... Pen- well, so, no. Here's, the, here's the thing, is because I kept mixing them both up because they're both very misunderstood, and I always, as I'm explaining them, I mix them up. 
Offsides prevents the cherry picking. It prevents players from being too far down the ice and creating an unfair advantage that forces another team to be out of play. Icing basically prevents interruption in play and game flow because no, who's going to want to come watch a team that after they go up one nothing, they just continually dump the puck down the ice. Yes. So what they created icing. This is what I don't understand. When you're saying a team that goes up one nothing, yep. they dump the puck down the ice. Okay, which direction are they dumping it? Towards, you, towards their own goalie. No, towards the opposing goalie. Okay. So they're dumping it all. So basically, all they're making the other team do is, would be chase the puck the entire time. Anytime I got it, I would just dump it all the way to the far end and just make them chase the puck. We're not playing so hockey. It makes them control it and move it as a Cor- unit. Correct. Mm-hmm. And the consequence of icing is having a face-off close to your goalie after you've iced. It keeps you from you know wanting to do that. You're giving away a free gaining of the offensive zone. If you ice the puck, got it. So it's, it's it clicked. Yeah, it's costly because everybody gets to start in the offensive zone. All your opponents do. Can I try to explain what I think I just learned? Yeah, good because we butchered it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so so we have we have red lines and we have blue lines. Mm-hmm. Red lines in the middle. Then I've got on the outside of that I have two blue lines on that side of that I have two red lines. Correct. And the red lines are closest to the goal. Okay, on offense, if my team is pushing up towards the goal that we're going to try to score in if one of us tries to cheat and runs out ahead of the puck and the body of our player goes beyond the blue line before the puck gets there that's offsides correct sir okay so if we're all playing and the other team is bringing the puck towards us Mm -hmm. and they're bringing it in and we're trying to defend and we just take the puck and we just shove it all the way down you know, we don't have a player trying to make an offensive move or anything, but we just like shove it out of our zone. We're like, hey, get that crap out of here. You got to go start over and reset and recalibrate. If we shove it all the way back there and it crosses the red line in the center of the ice, is that true? Or the, or the red the line? The red line is for where you are at. So if you're behind that in your own zone, yeah. Okay. So if, if we're in our own zone, which would be mm-hmm. the other team's offensive zone, and we shove it past the red line in the middle of the rink, that would be icing. The red line, the goal line at the far got it, end. Got it, got it, got so, it. Yeah, all the way against the boards on the other side. Yes. Okay, got it. So I understand now. Thank you. So so essentially icing is kind of something that is more important for the defense to not do, and offside is more important for the offense. Okay, I got it. Understood. Okay. Yes, sir. That hurt. I think that went pretty well. That hurt. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It's, I'm sore. It's hard. I mean, that, that's very difficult to explain that stuff. It is. Without, it is. I didn't even stress for visuals. <laughs> no, I got it. I got it. And I, I think Matt, <laughs> you, you helped when you said the penalty for icing is that the faceoffs happens down in the other team's offensive zone, which would be like right on my goal. That's why that's a problem. Okay, so in basketball, you have fouls and five fouls, and you're out. Mm-hmm. Hockey, you have these penalties in the penalty box. What's up there? Yeah, so uh, offsides and icing, those are not infractions that will cause you to go to the penalty box. A lot of the two-minute penalties, uh, the most more common ones you will see in hockey, are things like tripping, uh, putting your stick between a player's you know skates and tripping them, having them fall to the ice, uh, hooking when you take your stick and you literally, uh, whether it's the waist, chest, arm, is t- you're using your stick as a hook to hold them back. There's another one called holding, uh, where you're literally you could you hold a player from moving, you have high sticking. It, I've heard of high sticking. What is that one? High sticking is when your stick comes above the chest level and near the head, and okay. so all those small little scars you see on hockey players' face, the, usually that's from a high sticking. Is that why they don't have teeth? This high they sticking? do. As a matter of fact, uh, these two front teeth are fake. Yours are? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, same here, buddy. Yep. Yours are skateboard, Matt. Right. Mm-hmm. So Lee, are yours a high sticking thing? Uh, it, it was high sticking, but it was my fault. I was coming from um, a player was taking a shot, and as he swung back to take a slap shot, he hit me in the face with his stick. So why don't they have like helmets with face guards they, on them? They do. It happened very fast. I was young, and I got hit. My helmet came off, and I immediately turned around and skated. The ref had already blown the whistle, but it happened so fast that my helmet was off. He wound up, and I got cracked in the mouth. It also oh, broke man. my nose. Was that an actual high? Oh, the whistle had already blown, yeah. so you didn't get that. Yeah. But the whole purpose of these infractions or, the, or penalties, I guess mm-hmm. they're called, 
is whoever does the penalty has to go to the penalty box yep. for two minutes. Those were two-minute penalties. Now, if you fight, depending on how the fight developed, if you were the instigator as well as a participant, that could be a game misconduct, meaning you have to leave the game. But most of the time, if you have two players fight, that is a five-minute major, and uh, you're going to be in the box either five to ten minutes. And the reason that's important is because it reduces the number of players you have on the ice Correct. and gives what's called a power play. Yes, and the power play gives you the offensive advantage. Correct, because that takes one player off the ice for the opposing team, uh, giving you one extra player, giving you that chance to score. Huh, okay, sweet. All right, the power play ends after the time elapses or a goal is scored. Well, in the case yeah. of a two-minute minor. Yeah. So, oh, you mean if, if a then, goal is scored, then the two minutes just gets Correct, raised. so you have a power play, which is the team who has more players, and then you have a penalty kill which the team that the players in the box, they're literally trying to kill that penalty and wind down that time that that player's in uh, that two minutes or however long it is in, in the box. So they just take a defensive posture. Yep. Do they literally bring all of their players back to play defense? Usually what happens is your defenseman will stay back. You have a forward that kind of plays in the neutral zone, and then uh, which is the area between the two blue lines may play a little forward up, and then you'll have one who's a chaser. He's just going out there and buzzing around and trying to cause a little bit of chaos for uh, the, the offense handling the puck. Sweet. That's clear enough. So the team that the penalty's against and the players in the box, because they only have four players, they are allowed to ice the puck down the ice without being whistled and having the faceoff brought back into their zone. Oh, awesome. Okay. That makes sense. But the team that's on the power play and has the player advantage cannot. Icing can still be called. Okay, got it. Understand. So I think I understand the fundamentals of the game. All right. I think I understand checking. It's a thing that the enforcers typically do to protect the, you know, your your really good players. Um, I understand the mental aspect of the game. At least a little. Let's let's not get crazy. I don't understand it, but I know that yeah. it exists. Um. I can clearly see the physics of all this. This is very complicated. It's not it's not like baseball that's pretty simple. It's just ballistic curves. This is no. very complicated, and it has to do with the rink, and I'm assuming there's a whole thing about the Zamboni and when that happens that we're not even going to talk about here. So at this point, <laughs> the question remains, what does this mean? Because Matt and Yuli have both said that hockey is a metaphor for life, Yeah, and I don't... I don't really understand that at this point. How I translate it, and I think it translates perfectly into the world today and the, a lot of the things that we're all going through nowadays. You know, hockey is this beautifully chaotic sport, but we also we also have this great tradition. You know, you play this brutal sport for sixty minutes to where you know you're playing your heart out. Uh, you're beating each other up. You got agitators out there. You're scoring on one another. You're worn out. But at the end of the game, it's tradition that both teams line up, usually captain first, and you skate down a line, and everybody, you know, tired, sweaty, beaten up, and bloody, no matter what happened in that game, no matter what fights went down, cheap shots, dirty talk, whatever it was that went down, you all go down this line, and you shake each other's hand, some giving hugs, and you line up and you show sign of respect for your, your opponent. You know, life, like hockey, is, I think, beautifully chaotic. It's, and, and we all have our team. You know, you can be right wing or left wing or Trump or Biden or Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, mask, no mask, vaccines, no vaccines, person of faith, atheist. We all have our teams and our thoughts and opinions and beliefs and every once in a while, um, we're going to line up, and we're going to play, and we're not going to see eye to eye, and we're going to square off. And whether you're a playmaker out there like you, Destin, who's trying to drive home a point or a goal to effectively show your thoughts and opinions and beliefs, or you're a sniper like Matt, who uh, is just patiently waiting to find a, the perfect shot to, to drive home his information, or <laughs> you're an agitator like myself, and you're just out there you know, that guy, whether you're on the internet or whatever, the agitator just running his mouth to get under the other team's skin, that doesn't mean that when the game's over and we're all tight and beat up and bruised and bloody, we can't line them up, shake hands, uh, show some respect for one another. 
I think a big thing in today is there's such a lack of respect for other people's thoughts uh, and, and opinions if they don't see eye to eye with you. So uh, I think that's the biggest takeover, uh, you know, from the game in, in my point of view. I teared up. <laughs> 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 you did. Uh, he really teared uh, up. Golly, man. It really matters to you, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, golly. Wow. Literally tearing up. It does matter. And part of what I love about what you said there and what I think you've communicated better than I've maybe heard anybody communicate this about why hockey is awesome is that it's all of the grit and the blood and the energy and the camaraderie and the family. <laughs> It means something. Tennis is nice. I really have enjoyed getting to know tennis. It's nice. It's very cordial. You clap your racket when other people do nice things. And it means something. And it's a metaphor or constructive pushback on one set of things about how life is. But hockey is grittier. It's pushing back. It's speaking into something much, much bigger. But without taking the time... To hear somebody like you who gets it and loves it and has bled it explain it, we are all deprived of that. Lee, that was spectacular. Thank you, man. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, dude. Uh, I did not expect this topic to cover physics, history, psychology, yes. uh, human relations, international political disputes. I'll be honest. I had no idea. And thank you for entertaining my silly questions. You're welcome. I am. You know, I'm pretty amazing. So, <laughs> <laughs> and humble. <laughs> Told you before, the favorite thing I have about me being humble.